of no return. Point of no return. Are you eating? What the hell are you eating? Uh, oh, dude, we're live. Uh, <laughs> hey, we're live. TikTok, time to rock. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon to everyone who's watching from all over the world. If you don't know who I am by now, I think I'm going to let Sheikh Yasser Qadi tell you who I am. As for David Wood, I have rarely come across somebody who is more vulgar, vile, foul-mouthed, <laughs> noxious, repugnant, depraved excuse of a preacher. Whatever he is, David Wood, it is obvious to any person of faith, is not a man of God. He's a vulgar, <laughs> obscene, evil jerk. <laughs> Classic. Should have never should have never gave me a sound effects here. <laughs> that, that's uh, good. Man. So anyway, that's who I am, ladies and gentlemen. But with me, I have some other vulgar, obscene, evil jerks. Um, we've got uh, a man that the Hebrew Israelites call uh, Sons of Anarchy <laughs> Reject. Hey. <laughs> I don't have the look right now, though. It's, it's yeah, kind of it's, it's it. when you have your beard growing out and you have your uh, you have your hat on. Yeah, and that's when yeah. they call you a Sons of Anarchy reject. And then we have um, some dude shoveling uh, falafel into his face to remind him. You, do, you, do you guys even have falafel in Turkey? Did you have that back then? No, no. No. What did you guys? I ate it only. I ate it only once in my life when I went to Iraq for business, and it, it was it was horrible. I, I never understand why people like it. Man, you didn't go to Iraq for business. Um, hey. <laughs> I did. <laughs> hey, AP. Yes. Are there turkeys in Turkey? No. No turkeys. Turkeys, turkeys are banned in Turkey because of the because people make fun of it. No, so seriously. Like, 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 is there turkey? Of course there's turkey. <laughs> Wouldn't it be funny eating a turkey in Turkey? I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very, it's very fun. <laughs> All right. So uh, we are today talking about um, what's the title? The truth about Allah in Islamic theology. So we're going to go Allah's through beautiful leg. That's what we're talking. About. Yeah, we're going to go through. Did you say leg or legs? Leg. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Leg. Good. I missed. Okay. Just making sure. <laughs> Hop it around. Boing, 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 boing. <laughs> hey, hey, you need, AP, you need to get your animator to make what, what Allah looks like according to their description. I'm talking about like the Salafis and so on. I'm thinking of that. And yeah. then, and then, and then, but then animate it to where Allah has to hop around because he's got one yeah. leg and, and uh, some say two feet <laughs> and so on. So it looks like a, like a mermaid type thing. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, we're going to go through a clip from the recent exchange because we've been going through and, and pretty much you can pretty much go to any part of that exchange and there's stuff to unpack there. But uh, it was the uh, there was a part of this uh, PBD podcast where they started talking about division and Patrick uh, bet David started saying, ah, but, you know, the Muslims are united and so on. And uh, Robert and Rashid responded where in the name of common sense have you been for 14 centuries? Because these guys uh, have massive divisions. And then, of course, the Muslim side is, oh, but there are divisions in Christianity, which wasn't the issue. It was, it was the issue of him saying, hey, Muslims are united and, and Christians aren't. And so they went into all that. Anyway, interesting clip. But we wanted to break down part of the source from some of the divisions in the history. Uh, Rashid went through a bunch of them really rapid fire. And we're actually going to look at the basically Salafi theology of Allah, which is not universal. The different different Muslim groups. Again, Rashid points this out that you've had groups that were completely dominant, and then later on, they're viewed as completely heretical and so on. It, 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 it's there's been massive power shifts in the history of Islam, and they look back at this group. Ha ha! These guys were complete heretics and so on. Even though that was the dominant group for a while, and they've, they, this has been going on for a while. And so uh, we're going to look at the source of some division because you've got Muslims who listen to this stuff about Allah and they're like, OK, if Allah has revealed that about himself, that's just the way it is. And you've got other Muslims who think it's I mean, like this is seriously, seriously stupid. And so we're, gonna, we're also going to look at some point we're going to look at a clip of Khalil, who's an Ismaili Shia, and he had a debate with Jake, the Muslim metaphysician who uh, uh, let's say has a has one of the theologies that um, Muslim philosophers would think is absolutely silly. 
And uh, so we're going to see just 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 to show everyone what kind of divisions there are within Islam. And when someone comes along and says this is what Islamic theology is, you don't always know that that's true, even if they can point to their sources, because some people don't believe in those same sources even or some people interpret them differently. What do you want to say? To be fair, um, Jake, the Muslim metaphysician, doesn't know exactly what kind of theology he follows. He's all over the place. He. He's very inconsistent. He's not entirely sure if he's a traditionalist uh, or not. So I, th I think uh, Khalil, Khalil Andani, he has a he points out that the guy doesn't understand his own theology. But well, yeah, it's actually ahead. funny when when <laughs> when uh, when Khalil was was pointing out a view, he actually was quoting Muhammad Hijab to show that Muhammad Hijab has said the same thing. But he mm -hmm. just says it. And then uh, Jake says that that's not real Tawheed. <laughs> and, then, and, then, uh, and then Khalil's like, well, I was quoting Muhammad Hijab, whom you work for, <laughs> the Sapient Institute. And so, yeah, it's uh, it's funny. It's just, hey, if I think it's coming from this guy, then it's wrong and evil. Oh, it's coming from this guy. Uh, yeah, I, I might have to discuss that with him and find out what the, yeah. what the situation is. Um, <laughs> people keep combining that... Uh, Muhammad's claim that the eyes are the leather strap of the anus with um, with uh, so a pleasure bad. machine. Strap of the. I've got. I've got to watch. I've got to. I wasn't even going to watch it, but I have to watch. When was that? Was that was uh, what, that was, was it Daniel on the versus that was Daniel versus Dil Matt Dillahunty, right? Is, is that yeah, where it's a pleasure Matt machine? Dillahunty. Okay, I'm going to have to yeah, watch it. Just Daniel's so entire this. Daniel's entire opening oh. statement in the third part. That's the that's where he talks about the pleasure machine nonstop. What if I made a sound? What if I put a sound effect of that? Oh, I have to do it, man. You should. You should. We have to yeah, do it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have that as a sound effect, uh, hopefully, for soon. next show. Inshallah. Yeah. Should we go ahead and jump into some of this video? Hey, on, nope. a, on a side nope. note, on a side note, Anthony. Yeah. If you were to convert to Islam and believe in Islam, what, what group do you think you'd be part of? Uh, the group that... Mufti Abu Layth says is absolutely idiotic because that's true Islam, which is the Salafi group. But I, I you're asking if I was to become a Muslim. Yeah, if you suddenly if you suddenly you if you suddenly saw yeah, if you suddenly saw you're asking if I, I lost all my brain cells and no, 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 no. this religion was true. I'm saying suppose yeah. suppose one of these guys said Muhammad is in the Bible and you actually go to <laughs> Song of Solomon five sixteen and then it was clear <laughs> clear to you. No, he's he's actually there. He is really there. Right. And so you yeah. see that it's true. Muhammad was right. You convert. But there, there's all sorts of different Muslims. So you're saying that if you were to convert to Islam, you would be a Salafi. Yeah. So I think Salafism is nearest to what Muhammad was actually conveying. Yeah, that's m my view. AP, what's your view? This is a weird thing to to think for me because I already <laughs> was a Muslim and I was basically uh, two kinds of Sunni Muslim, one after the other, which is uh, I was in I was more Sufi oriented and then I just became regular mainstream Hanafi Sunni Muslim. And when I look back, um, the Sufi perspective does not make sense, but it was very uh, but it was at least kind of um, feel good kind of uh, Islam. Um, I don't know if, if I if I had to go back, I would, I guess, find a balance between the traditionalist and the mainstream Sunni perspective. Uh, interesting, interesting. Um, yeah, so the issue is, Anthony and I think that uh, if we were to believe, if we were to believe that Muhammad's a true prophet, that we would go the, the Salafi route, because it looks like, it looks like that is closest to what we find in the sources that we cover one one issue i've been thinking about though recently is uh our, our perspective may be skewed because these are the types of guys who are constantly coming at us so these are the guys we're interacting with so these are the guys whose sources we're reading to quote back to them and not of course re, you know not of course thinking that they're 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 muslims who reject those who sahih al-bukhari and sahih muslim and so on um so there is an issue of whether our perspective is screwed um, yeah. screwed up I'd say by on, our Muslim friends. Yeah, I'd say on this issue, on the issue of Akita, which is foremost in my thinking, when I look at these different groups, this is going to be 
a major factor in my evaluation of them is, you know, what are they saying about God? Because everything else flows from that. So when I look at the sources, I think the Salafis are nearest to what the sources are saying about Allah because not because I think they get it perfectly right. I think Muhammad was just a pagan who thought much the same as other pagans about his deity. He thought he was an embodied being, and that was very common at the time. And uh, I don't think that Salafis would be that crude, though I they are saying something that approaches that, and so I think they're closer. So on this sort of issue, I just to me it's just all too clear. I, I can't, at this point, read the sources without seeing the evident anthropomorphism throughout them. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to see why some of that is. But we're going to go through this clip where they discuss division first, just uh, because we're going to we're going to go ahead and take a look at why they've got some of these divisions. And so let's go ahead and check out a video clip. And guys, just shout uh, pause whenever we want to pause. It By the way, we were just talking about uh, Muhammad in the Bible. There is actually um, an, another theory uh, that Muhammad is in Deuteronomy twenty three thirteen. And uh, so I checked it myself, and it looks very credible. Uh, if you check Deuteronomy 23.13, 23, uh, it says there, as part of your equipment, have something to dig with. And when you relieve yourself, dig a hole and cover up your excrement. And uh, so that, that last word there seems to be uh, corresponding to, to Muhammad. That, that, is, that is my view. And I think this is a very, very strong one. So I would suggest uh, researching that a little bit further, David. Powerful, powerful, powerful stuff. Powerful. Yeah. And I think that's probably that's probably the best argument for Muhammad in the Bible. Most likely, yeah. I'm uh, looking it up as we speak. I wouldn't want to miss something like that. Well, yeah, it's powerful. Deuteronomy 23, 13. Is, that's while you're, while you're looking that up, Anthony, we'll go ahead and uh, check out this clip. <laughs> okay. According to the business of religion, they're going to win. And there's nothing Christians can do about it. By the business... You can sit and argue the faith all you want. They're getting their people and their kids baptized because their job isn't recruiting Christians to become Muslims. They've only converted 20,000. That's not a lot. It's not a big number. But they're getting more kids, and they're raising their kids with the loyalty to the parents, and they're following that faith, and they're growing bigger, and we're not doing that. What, is your, what are your thoughts to that? Uh, just a side note. Notice he's, uh, he's adopting the Andrew Tate perspective where Andrew Tate described his view of Islam like a, like the stock market, like you're betting on a stock. Um, well, these guys who are going to, you know, uh, who are willing to kill everyone who disagrees with them and so on, they're going to be the ones who outlast everyone who isn't willing to do that stuff. Uh, here, uh, it's interesting, Patrick, uh, bet David is just focusing on like the birth rates and so on. Hey, they're going to, they're going to outkid you. They're going to have kids faster than you. And if they have kids faster than you, and at least most of those kids remain Muslims, they're eventually going to outnumber you, and therefore it's inevitable. Yeah. Uh, any comments before we move on? <coughs> nope. I didn't, I didn't pay attention. Yeah, let's, oh, let's, my well, goodness. One thing I, yeah. With co-hosts well, well, like this, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> one thing I would say is what's true of Christians in one part of the world, or even non-Muslims generally, is not necessarily true of them elsewhere in the world. So the birth mm -hmm. rate, among Christians in certain places might be lower than it used to be, but it's in other places higher. So they have to take that into account. But there's also all sorts of changes that take place in history. You know, there, there have been different periods in Christian history where the church was stronger, the church was weaker, and, and these things tend to go up and down, and you can't predict those sorts of things. I mean, all he's really saying here is just looking at the trajectory of something, this is what it looks like given, you know, these considerations. But all sorts of things, just like the stock market, right? You can't, you can't determine how things are ultimately going to go. And if you think you can, that's how you get roped into some of the bad deals that people try and sell you, right? So uh, that's, that's one thing, but uh, it doesn't make it anything true. I, I don't know what point he's making with this here, but, uh, you know, the, the more interesting question is whether Islam is true and whether they're growing exponentially is, is sort of irrelevant to that. Or not sort of, it is, it is irrelevant to that. Yeah, and I think, uh, I think Rashid's going to point out that even though there are higher birth rates, it, guys, high birth rates are connected to uh, like third world countries and so on. It's basically uh, the more opportunity, the more prosperous a nation is and the, uh, the more opportunities there are for people to do things, uh, generally the lower the birth rates become. Because now people, let's say, you know, people aren't getting married when they're young. They're going to school and 
lots of times going to college and then getting married later and, and birth rates go down because they're doing more stuff in life and starting families later and so on versus uh, an area where there's nothing for women or girls to do or girls don't even go to school or something like that. They get married off when they're 12 or 13. They start having kids. By the time they're in their late 20s, which lots of you know, lots of women in the West in the late twenties, that's when lots of women are starting to have a family. Um, you know, someone in a girl in like Afghanistan might already be on her sixth or seventh kid by then. So higher birth rates. And so the idea is that because of Im Islam's impact on women and society, that you end up with uh, higher birth rates and therefore they're just going to outnumber you. The problem of course there is uh, as even Islamic societies tend to modernize, the birth rates decline. And so that's uh, something that Rashid is going to point out, that the, the birth rates are actually dropping. Uh, from yeah, I, I remember this from a, from, from a basic, um, I don't know, sociology study with the whole um, change of birth rates over over time. And it's um, birth rates uh, continuously uh, decline until they stabilize as as societies uh, develop and become, uh, you know, more advanced and have more uh, time, have less of a concern to just uh, work and survive. Um, and and this, the same thing, as you just pointed out, even happens among Muslims. And uh, what what is what is uh, what 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 studies of um, Muslims in Europe show is that Muslims in Europe have um, lower birth rates than Muslims uh, from than Muslims in those countries that they came from. Uh, but they have higher birth rates, I think, on average, like 50 percent higher birth rates than the natives of those European countries. But the, but even the Muslim birth rates um, significantly drop as as they adapt to the society and become as advanced as those European populations are. There, there is still a difference between um, Muslim birth rates and Christian birth rates or Muslim birth rates and birth rates of any other religion, actually, I, th I think. Mm -hmm. uh, but 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 uh, but the modernization is helping uh, a is cause a big decline in the fertility rates of Muslims as well. Yeah. And so the the rates are still uh, as of as of the Pew study that everyone cites to say that Islam, it's it's always funny because the Pew study said that the reason for the rapid growth of Islam was birth rates because mm -hmm. Muslims have higher birth rates than everyone else. Uh, but Muslims took this to say, ah, you see, this is because so many people are converting to Islam. That is not what the claim was. Um, and uh, subsequent subsequent articles showed that even though Muslims have the highest birth rates and therefore Islam is growing, they also have declining birth rates. And so it's not and, going to, that, yeah. bump, that, bump is, that bump is not going to last forever. Conversion plays uh, little to no role in terms of... Uh, yeah, because people are basically leaving Islam. As, mm -hmm. Even back then, people were leaving Islam as fast as people were converting to Islam, so there was no no net change there. But mm -hmm. you have to wonder, with this avalanche of apostasy that they're freaking out mm -hmm. about, is, uh, are the, is apostasy now mm -hmm. making that... Is apostasy now outweighing the number of people who are converting? I'd be interested in seeing what the stats on there. Uh, yeah. Benjamin, you sent this multiple times. Uh, you need to, if you did not want to send that multiple times, uh, check your stuff. Uh, so Benjamin said, hey, David, whenever the topic of the Quran's view of the Bible comes up with my Muslim friends, it always ends with them telling me to go to the scholars. So how would, uh, what should be the response to this? Uh, I would say, look, your God claims that his revelations are perfectly clear. You can go to multiple passages in the Quran saying that the Quran is perfectly clear, and then go to a bunch of passages in the Quran where Allah affirms the inspiration and the preservation and the authority of the Bible. And then uh, after going through all that and showing it, putting, out, putting it in their faces, say, so what, what do you think a Muslim scholar is going to explain? To me? Is he going to explain, is he going to be more clear than Allah? Because Allah sounds like he's doing nothing but affirming my scriptures. And so if Allah means something else, you're, you're telling me this, this Muslim scholar is going to be greater, a, a clearer communicator than Allah? Why didn't Allah say it the way your uh, your scholar is saying it? And uh, you can point out that, you know, these scholars, what actually happened in the history of Islam is the earliest view, the earliest Muslim view was that when the Quran is condemning the Jews and Christians on how they deal with their scripture, it's because we were perverting it. We were, we were misrepresenting it. 
in what we said about it. Um, but that didn't uh, that didn't work for very long because eventually people go to the scriptures of the Jews and Christians and find out they don't line up with Islam. And then so the Muslim story had to change to no, actually, uh, they corrupted their text, which completely contradicts both Muhammad and the Quran. And so you can point out, hey, what a Muslim scholar says today, he says, because there's no other way out. Well, there is a, there is another way out. It's to abandon Islam. But once you recognize what Islam teaches about the Bible, uh, they're stuck. So, yeah, I'd go that route. Yeah. Well, if also, you're asking me what... Oh, my goodness, what? <laughs> Surah 931 goes right with what you just said. They take mm -hmm. their rabbis and their monks for their lords apart mm -hmm. from Allah, mm -hmm. which is, of course, what they're doing, right? Good they're point. saying Good go point. to the scholars instead of Allah. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, did you, and you catch know how that? Muhammad... You know how Muhammad interpreted that, right? Right When people yes. challenged Muhammad yeah. about this, saying that Christians and Jews take their rabbis and monks for their lords, he says, well, they listen to them, right? They, they uh -huh. listen to their, their teachings, their interpretations over what Allah says. So for the Muslim now to be doing, I mean, I, I've said it numerous times. We've said it a lot together that Islam brings in through the back door what it pretends to have exiled through the front door, right? Muhammad will criticize the pagans for something, but then reintroduce it under another name. Well, here he's doing the same thing, or at least his religion, his co-religionists, his followers are doing this when they tell you to go to the scholars instead of to what Allah said in the Quran. The Quran was supposed to be trumping what all the scholars were getting wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, the, 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 point, the point Anthony there is making is when Allah has said something and someone goes to some, to some human being to say, oh, tell me something else, then... According to Muhammad, that person has just committed shirk. So the claim is that in Surah 9, verse 31, when it says Jews and Christians take our priests and rabbis as lords, the objection to Muhammad is, what are you talking about? They're not worshiping them. And Muhammad said, no, when they, when they listen to them instead of listening to Allah, or when they go with what they say rather than what Allah says, you're taking them as a lord. So if Allah says that the scriptures of the Jews and Christians are good as gold, and some imam or some sheikh says, no, it's been corrupted. And you say, I'm going with the sheikh or the imam. You're, ba you're taking him as a lord over you. You're, you're, you're committing shirk. And so, uh, yeah, good point, Anthony, for once in your entire life. <laughs> what are you laughing at, AP? Nothing, right. nothing. Let's David is an evil jerk. Yeah, my shake. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway. Quote Yasser Qadi. Shake Yasser Qadi. That should be. I should put the full quote like in, in uh, in all my descriptions of me. Get a shake Yasser Qadi brings Evil all the boys to the yard. <laughs> the solution is obviously Christians have to recover a sense of their faith and a sense of what's at stake, because what you're talking about will happen if this continues. Is that the United States will look like Egypt? or Saudi Arabia, or Iran, those were not always the heart of the Islamic world. Those were conquered and Islamized. And the Christians were, like Rashid was saying, were put, made second class, made subject to all kinds of humiliating and discriminatory regulations, and had to pay a special tax that's specified in the Quran, chapter 9, verse 29. And they Ultimately, most of them in those areas and in North Africa, other areas like that, they, uh, r many of them thought, you know, why am I suffering this and having to live in this way? All I have to do is convert to Islam and I can live a decent life. And most of them did. And so you have areas that were 99% Christian and now they're 99% Muslim. And so people don't realize, they think, they look at Egypt and they say, well, that's the Islamic world. They don't realize that these things are always in flux and that exactly what happened there is beginning to happen in the West. And so I think that if Christians were to come to realize what's at stake, which would be extraordinarily difficult given the amount of propaganda and falsehood that's spread about these issues in the mainstream, then they might begin to realize that they need to take. What's the solution, steps. though? What's the what's the next? Uh, you, you know, it's funny. You know, it's funny and all that. <laughs> so Robert's someone who, for the past twenty years, has been telling people this is what Islam teaches, and for twenty years he's been called a liar. Shame on you, Robert Spencer. You say that Islam has a death penalty for apostates. Shame on you. You say that Islam promotes child marriage. Say, shame on you. You say that Islam promotes wife beating. Shame on you. You say Islam has is connected to all these things. And now the Dawah guys are shouting these things from the rooftops 
which is basically saying, yeah, Robert was right all along. He was completely correct in what he warned you about. But now we're getting to the point where we can tell you the truth about it because we regard ourselves as unstoppable at this point. And uh, <laughs> well, and, and notice that and Robert, the label- Robert, Robert's still trying to figure out how do we get people to understand this? It's like, the guys are literally telling you what they're going to do and you still don't you still don't get it. And so yeah, I don't I don't know <laughs> Robert Ro- Robert's pointing out I don't even know if if Christians can get the point at this in this stage because I mean when the guys are literally telling you what they want and you still won't believe them. I don't believe you Daniel when you say you promote child marriage. I don't believe it. I think you're making this up like Robert Spencer. Like how do you Let's uh, just talk about Dylan Mulvaney in stage. Yeah. Now what no what about Dylan Mulvaney? Go ahead Anthony. <laughs> No, I was just going to make the brief point that he he still wears the label, though. He's he was an Islamophobe for allegedly reading them this way, saying that they believe in death to apostates, that sort of thing. Now they're admitting that that's what they teach. That's the prescription against apostasy. But he's still an Islamophobe. right? So yep. the, the label still stays, uh, but the grounds for it are no longer there. Yeah, it's it's an it's an awesome situation. It's an awesome situation. <laughs> Robert, you are an you were an Islamophobe for the past twenty years for saying these things about Islam. Now the Dawa guys are admitting you were completely correct, but you're still an Islamophobe because uh, you, don't you don't you don't want these things to happen to you and to everyone else. Shame on you, Robert. You racist, Islamophobic, hate mongering bigot. Uh, super chat here. Yo, Dr. Dizzle, would you debate hijab again if invited to PBD podcast? Uh, P.S. Hey, AP and Anthony, keep rocking. Uh, yes, I, I totally would, but that's not going to happen. You could tell that uh, hijab and Ali Dawa are looking for people who aren't going to criticize Islam. And notice yeah. they always they always keep the topic off Muhammad, uh, off Muhammad and the Quran. They, they, they might be willing to debate theology or something like that in certain circumstances. But they're not gonna they're not gonna go into a situation where Muhammad and the Quran are going to be um criticized. And so that was their reason for backing out of this discussion. They knew that Robert and Rashid would be pointing out issues and they didn't want to deal with them. Um so yeah, they're no, they're gonna be looking for people who might object on the like they, they suggested William Lane Craig and Ben Shapiro. So William Lane Craig, he will criticize Islam, but he's gonna be criticizing the theology, the concept of God. He's not going to be blasting away at Muhammad in the Quran. So that's pretty clearly who they're looking for someone where Muhammad is not going to be on the table for discussion. And so uh, how about we stop the hate mongering and talk about uh, what we have in common, all, all of us instead? Yes. Uh, Would Dylan Mulvaney be welcomed in your mosque if he repented? We have we have yeah, this yeah. in common. We like our heads attached to our bodies. Shame on you. What that's we don't have in common uh, is your I'm desire to sever. That I'm a fool. <laughs> steps what is the solution well, they, from your standpoint they have to have larger families certainly and have to uh, meet the 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 dawa the proselytizing initiatives and be able to answer all the objections to show the the inhumane aspects but of Christians Islam. are not that united these guys uh, are right. united exactly uh, uh, all right that's that sets everything in motion right there he says but muslims are united <laughs> christians where, are do, united. where does he get this idea from I have zero like clue he's just getting it from from some of the muslims who say that but there is no well, such thing well, I, muslims are not more united than christians are yeah rashid's about to destroy that but uh but yeah. what what do you want to say, Anthony? Well, what I think in part, I don't think it's excusable or what have you, but I think what happens is anybody who's an outsider to another group, they just see it as just this sort of general yeah. thing, right? That yeah. they don't, they're not part of, they don't know a whole lot about. But once they start studying it, they learn that's not true. And if they get inside it, they learn even more that it's not true. And, and that's just true of everything, right? If, uh, if I didn't spend any time reading about atheism, mm-hmm. I would just think all atheists think the same thing but I know that's not true. I would think that Christians teach the same thing. I know that's not true, right? There's differences among people, and that's just always the case. It's true of any group, and you can know that almost a priori, right? You can know that without even knowing about the group. So I I think what's irresponsible here is is just sort of running with the idea that they're monolithic just because he's not particularly informed about their material. But I understand that he wouldn't know the ins and outs, the nuances, the, yeah. the variations. The point is, why is, why is he saying that? Why why would someone say that if he hasn't looked into it? I mean, he seems yeah. like a pretty, pretty careful, well-researched guy. He just made this, like, even like in his lifetime, I mean, you saw ISIS going around just publicly executing Shias for, uh, for, for being of the wrong sect. I mean, how many times have we heard in the news 
that a mosque was blown up or, or, or shot up or something like that in Pakistan. And you think, oh, did, did some Islamophobes do that? No, it's someone from a different sect of Islam over and over again. But I mean, uh, yeah, my goodness, how do you how, how do you know? So th that's and the point is that stuff you can hear about in the news. How do you miss things like that? If you're actually familiar with these guys, which Dawa guys are not attacking other Dawa guys? Right. I mean, every single every single the, the Dawa guys from every group are attacking the other guys from other groups. And we call them. the. I mean, I call them the Dawa Wars. I keep posting Dawa Wars. Oh, look, here's what Sajid says about this guy. Here's what this guy says about that guy and so on. Uh, hopeless division. And so, yeah, I don't know what you mean by united here, but it's, this, this led to a nice little interesting uh, section. It's here. not even, it's not even just the Shia, like the ISIS, ISIS were uh, declaring war on, on and killing um, fellow Sunni Muslims because they would refuse to uh, recognize them as their, as their caliphate, or because, uh, you know, they would collaborate with other um, entities, with other nations, with other groups that, uh, that do not recognize the caliphate. Uh, even within, I mean, if, even within Salafi Islam, there is a huge uh, war going on. Within non-Salafi Sunni Islam, there is constant uh, infighting going on between uh, Shia and Sunnis. The Shias are not united at all. They are completely different and deny uh, the, the fundamentals of each other. That There is no unity uh, like that at all. It's, 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 it's a ridiculous idea. And as Anthony pointed out, it might just be the, the whole illusion of not understanding yeah. the group. And, and fortunately, uh, yeah, this is about to be destroyed right here. So let's check it out. Christians are competing against each other. Muslims are more united. You, yeah. Oh, no, no. I, I disagree to that. We have Shia, we have Sunni. They are fighting each other. I they're agree. killing each Fair other. Fair enough, yes. And and so they are not really united. And if you go to Salafis, they will make the Sufis as mushriks. But would you agree that Sunnis and Shias are united at least in the values? No. Not necessarily because, you know, the cousin or, you know, Ooh, that's the history talk, part yeah. where who got the past down. I'm talking purely values and philosophies. You know what? Muslims will claim we are one. 1.7, and when you ask them details, they will be Ahmadis are not Muslims, Shia are not Muslims, and you will find just the guy in his mosque at the end uh, instead. Of <laughs> that, was, that, was, that was actually funny. Rashid's actually Rashid's a funny dude. So he said, "Hey, if you start asking, is that guy? So what? Hey, we've got 1.7 billion, 1.7 billion Muslims. Yeah, you see, they're and they're all on the same page. They're united. He's like, if you start asking them questions, hey, is that group Muslim? No, is that group Muslim? No, is that group Muslim? It eventually is down to like the the last guy in his mosque, and he's like, no, I'm the only I'm the only real Muslim here. That's interesting stuff. It, I was. It reminds me of the quote that I was telling you about from Abu Musab. I remember this was many many years ago, but Abu Musab, he is a Salafi Muslim." And I was watching a video of his the other day where he was said that Daniel Hakikachu is a chronic liar. Almost everything he says is a lie. And often he says more than one lie in a sentence. And so that's Abu Musab's evaluation of Daniel Hakikachu. Mm -hmm. Just shows you something of the difference. But that same Abu Musab, many years ago, he was lecturing. And it's still vivid in my mind because I remember hearing it and thinking, this is so different than what I always hear from these Dawagandists, right? I'm always hearing these guys pretend like they're uniform in their teachings. And I know from reading stuff that they're not, but they're not admitting this. Well, here's this Muslim who is, and he's he's over there in Jeddah, right? He's over there in Saudi Arabia, uh, the heart of, of things in some respects. Well, anyways, he said, if we all came together, if Muslims were truly united, he said, all we would have to do is spit and Israel would be wiped out of existence, right? So that's how big we are, how powerful we are if we were united. But then he says, but, but that's not true. He says, we can't even come together in the same masjid. He says, why? Because this guy says Allah has attributes. This guy says Allah does not have attributes. This guy says Allah has names, but not attributes. This guy says Allah has attributes, but not names. This guy says Allah is on his throne. This guy says that Allah is not on his throne. This guy says Allah is everywhere. This guy says Allah is nowhere. And he keeps going like this. And I'm like, now this is what I'm used to in the sources, but not what I hear from the Dawagandists. Yeah. Um, and I mean, just think just think about the, the point there, because he was making he was making an important point, like with all with all of these Muslims. And, you know, the the numbers are the, the 1.7 billion that they're talking about. That's possibly outdated because I've heard more recently, you know, in the range of one point nine, close to two billion. But think about it, if they were actually united as uh, PVD thinks, I mean, who, who could stop them? I mean, who could stop them if they were actually united? Yeah. Uh, but they can't. They're constantly fighting amongst themselves. 
Um, so you know, you, you know, you just reminded me of Anthony. You reminded me of uh, uh, Cyrus and the Warriors, where Cyrus is saying, "Hey, if all the if all the gangs of New York aligned, we out we outnumber the police four to one. So how would how would how would they stop us if we were united? That but we can't because we're always fighting with each other. And of course, they they kept fighting with each other. The it always reminds movie. me of a prison where you've got like two guards watching over 150 inmates in a in a wing, you know. <laughs> Obviously, it only takes a couple of inmates to or maybe even just one, right, who's been hitting the weights or something to take out the guards. But they always manage to sort of keep control on things. Well, yeah. most of the time. Yep. All right. 1.7. I lived that. When you really scrutinize yeah. them, you will find just the guy in his mask. They are the ones. Actually, Muhammad said his, his people will divide to 73 uh, groups, and one yes. of them only go to heaven. So 72 of them, they are just like kuffar. They are not really Muslims. So let, let's go back to that. Pause, pause, uh, pause, pause. This is actually the most important point, in my opinion, because uh, even when the Muslims try to claim that they are united, citing uh, this very idea, and there are, there are multiple of, of that, uh, shows that even their own prophet confirms, uh, if you want to accept it as a prophecy, that they would be extremely divided and they would, that there would be no unity among Muslims. And will they really deny what their own prophet says? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Stuck with it. Placement rate, yeah. for example, in some countries like Iran is below. It's below 2.1. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. In Turkey, it's below 2.1. Mm -hmm. In others, they are below that. So there is there is a huge drop. For example, in Morocco, I think it was like 6.9, and now it's like 2.8 or 2.7. So next generation will be below replacement rate. So they will suffer also from from. Uh, you believe that? So I, you I, believe I, their I, numbers is going to go below the Christian yeah, replacement? Uh, I will believe they will drop because we have so, so many challenges, economy, so many other things. And another thing, they don't count how many people are leaving Islam. Notice, guys, uh, Rashid is just wrecking the claim right now. And he's going yeah. like he's going like point by point. So he's pointing out, hey, you think they're united? You don't know what you're talking about. Uh, there, there's const there's there's endless division. And if you look at their if you look at their actual claims, they're all saying that all these other groups aren't really Muslims. If you look at their sources, Muhammad himself said that they're going to divide up into all these different sects and only one of them is going to be uh, the, the true Muslims. And then uh, on the issue of birth rates and how, cause Patrick patch, uh, PBD was pointing out that it's inevitable. You've already lost just on birth rates. You're going to lose. Rashid's pointing out, look how rapidly the birth rates are dropping in certain areas. It was, I think he said 6.9 guys. If, if you don't know what that means, it means it's talking about how many, you know, how many children, uh, the average couple, is having so it goes from 6.9 to 2. Point something that is a massive massive drop in birth rates and basically there's 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 a level once you go below it that you don't even have enough to replace your people who are dying so that's a concern when a nation uh when their birth rates drop below like whatever it is 2.1 or something like that you no longer have enough people entering uh who are being born to to enter the workforce 18 years later um, to replace the people who are retiring and dying and so on. So there are concerns with the with the lower birth rates. But I mean, Rashid's just kind of going point by point here on everything that was said and uh, shredding it as far as I can tell. We don't have statistics. I have statistics. Oh, and there he's pointing out, you don't have statistics on how many people in these countries are still counted as Muslims, even though they're not Muslims anymore. They just can't tell you because they're atheists or Christian or something like that. They're still kind of, he points out that he's still counted as officially as a Muslim. <laughs> in 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 Morocco, he's still uh, he, the the government. He would still be counted as that. For example, people who write to me, according just to my show, from Morocco, from Algeria, from Iran, for example, so many people are leaving to atheism, to mm -hmm. Christianity, mm -hmm. to other to other worldviews in Egypt, in Saudi Arabia. So they don't count that. I still count it as a Muslim in the one point seven. Yep. And many uh, people like me. So if they give freedom and we do real surveys. We will have the number less. Another thing, what Islam is left? The West forced Muslims to abolish slavery. 
to not yes. practice the real Islam, like imputing hands and feet and crucifying. They, they are now forcing them to have one wife. So Islam, <laughs> the version of Islam in the Muslim world is not really what they are preaching. So what Muslims do we have? According to their standards, probably most of them are Kafir. These guys are quiet, too. And, and not only that, it's because of the death penalty for apostasy that this is Another unreported. Point. But also there a was break. a survey, and people did answer the anonymous survey recently in Iran, only 40% of the population identified as Muslim. Now, that's extraordinary, and it shows how inhumane Sharia Islamic law who is. Who ran that poll? Who, what, who? I don't remember who ran it, right. but it's, it's easy to find. We can look it up Rob, here. can you look it up? 1979 oh, to now, Got it, we've right had there. Islamic law in Iran, and now... Only now 60% of Iranians have rejected Islam. That's because they've lived it since 1979 and they realize how much they don't like it. Yeah. Um, that's awesome. Yeah. Uh, now, that's a study that could possibly be skewed <coughs> in some way because it was, it's an online. So you need it in order to be anonymous because you can't just go around asking because then it, people will be exposed. But it was an online survey and 40 percent of 50,000 Iranians, only 40 percent identified as Muslim. Officially, they're all still Muslim. Officially, all those people are still Muslim. Mm. So they're counted as part of the 1.7 billion Muslims in the world. They're counted, even though, look, 60 percent of them, 60 percent of them are not Muslims. Right. Mm. Um, so that's what's being pointed out. Again, that could that could be skewed a little bit just because it's not counting you know, if you have a village where people don't have easy internet access and aren't going to respond. So it, it could be it could be a higher percentage. The point is, that's a lot of people who are counted as Muslims who aren't actually Muslims. And we've seen it before with the uh, avalanche of apostasy stuff where um, these guys, uh, they're, they're complaining that, that they're actually closet millions of closet atheists and so on in Muslim countries. Um, and what do we do about this stuff? And remember that remember that clip by uh Gosh, what's his name? What was the guy who said that he's personally met hundreds of uh, people who are Asadullah, Asadullah. Asadullah Ali? Yeah, yeah. He's pointing out that he has personally met because people come to him when he's just going around speaking and stuff, and they come out and they confide in him. Hey, I'm not really, I don't really believe any of this, but I mean, I I lead the prayers at the mosque, and I don't actually believe any of this stuff. And he's pointing out that these these people are in madrasas and so on. They're uh, they they people people who had memorized the Quran and so on, and they actually don't believe any of it. But they're scared what the response from their family or from uh, their community is going to be if they come out and say that they are um, that they're they're apostates now. And so the idea is <laughs> that you have all these apostates. In one video, I said one day you're gonna one day you're gonna have a situation where. The, the imam at a mosque says, guys, you know, all right, I have something to tell you. I actually don't believe in this stuff. I'm an imam, uh, but I don't actually believe in this stuff. And he's going to, you know, I'm going to take my penalty now. And another hand's going to go up. Actually, I don't believe in this either. Another hand's going to go up. They're going to find out they're all actually apostates and they were all just pretending to be Muslims. Uh, but that that's what happens when you have uh, death penalties or other kinds of harsh penalties for apostates is you end up with lots of post lots of apostates who won't tell you and you're just going to have to deal with those consequences here pretty soon all right let's get back to this um, yeah i just want to comment because they're talking a lot about the supposed mm -hmm. disunity amongst uh muslims as if you don't have that in christianity right oh, yeah, you <laughs> wait what no <laughs> Notice, Rashid this guy just is so disconnected Rashid from logic. She just pointed at she just blasted yeah. everything that was claimed, and this guy the this guy only has one speak. What about Christianity? What about Christian? No one said no one said that, right? Pat PBD said PBD said they're united. Christians aren't, and Rashid said no, no, no. I have no idea what you're talking about, but this. And then he responded to PBD's uh, comment about the uh, about the birth rates make it inevitable that Islam is going to win. And saying, no, they're way more divided and the birth rates are dropping. And sorry, you don't know what you're talking about. And his response, ah, but you're saying that Christians aren't divided. <laughs> where, where have you, where, what were you listening to, dude? But notice. This guy really like, thinks that do, he's a great right? thinker. It's just dumb, man. He's doing what Hakikachu does. Like anything they say, flip it back. Anything they say, yeah. but Christianity. Anything they say, do not answer. Just what, what, what about Christianity? Yeah, interesting. So, uh, Rashid, I know that Robert here is uh, Eastern Orthodoxy. 
<laughs> Let me back this up. Look what he's trying to do here, right? <laughs> this is... Do you, guys, do you guys realize how funny this is? They pointed out all these divisions. Hey, you guys are all killing yourselves and so on. Uh, and you guys all view everyone else as not Muslim. And so he's going to try and do it right here. Hey, so look, this is what Robert is. What are you, Rishi? We're going to get some division there. Let me back it up because it's awesome. It's a lot about the supposed disunity amongst uh, Muslims as if you don't have that in Christianity, right? Oh, I mean, yeah, you do. Y you do, right? So uh, R Rashid, I, I know that Robert here is uh, Eastern Orthodox. He, he used to be Catholic. So kill him. Uh, we'll what kill denomination him. or sect of Christianity do you belong to? <laughs> yeah, you have because to fight. we are converts in Morocco, we don't follow anything. We just follow I'm saying, like, do you go to a specific church? I meant went to many. Orthodox, Protestant, I don't care. Really. Okay, so anyway, my, my point is my point is my point oh, that lost. ain't gonna work oh because i thought you were gonna guys were gonna kill each other <laughs> you have the th <laughs> me and daniel are good because we're the we're the we're salafis and stuff but uh, i thought you were gonna kill each other oopsie <laughs> Uh, but notice what notice what Rashid's saying. We're apostates. It's not like we can, you know, be out there publicly as part of a, a, a particular denomination. We'd be spotted as apostates. Yeah. Sex and Christianity, the Protestants, the Catholics, the Eastern Orthodox. Historically, they fought with each other over very, you know, what from the outside people would think, well, why are they fighting over this? I mean, today, the Orthodox and Catholics are fighting over uh, doctrines like the Filioque. Notice how Lu notice fighting, right? Mm. What do you mean here? Because when we talk about, I mean, when we talk about. Sunnis killing Shias. We're talking about Sunnis killing Shias. Yeah. What do you mean fighting here? They're still like debating these things. Um, Whether or not the uh, holy That's basically a massacre. See, they they disagree. disagree. Spirit proceeds forth from the Father and the Son, or the Father alone eternally, and and they're completely divided on this, and you know, call each other heretics and all kinds of stuff. So oh. to act as if, right, there's this division among Sunnis and Shia when, no one as said that. I think Patrick see rightly how, pointed See how completely, how completely irrelevant yeah. this whole speech here is. It, it has nothing yeah. to do at all with, nothing. Uh, with, with, with with what the other side is claiming. The other side never claimed, hey, we are all, all united and it is, an, it is only an Islamic problem that they are uh, all divided. That that was never said. Yeah. It was, the only thing that was said here is Patrick, but David made the claim that Muslims are united, whereas Christians are not. And uh, Brother Rashid then rightly pointed out, uh, and Robert Spencer as well, that Muslims are actually not that united, that they are actually very, very divided, and that there is a lot of infighting. Yeah, they, cor suddenly, they corrected yeah, a they false claim. claim. Yeah, yeah, yeah suddenly, they corrected it, multiple false claim. claims. Yeah, this guy is now co coming in here and trying to uh, say, "What? How? What are you talking about? Christians are divided." Okay, but... no one's no one said otherwise. <laughs> the claim yeah. was, "You guys are united, and you guys are." And he pointed out, "No, it doesn't actually work yeah. like that." Well, I don't know what to do now, here, man. I haven't I haven't heard this yet, but I'm I'm already gonna I can pretty much bet if if he gets time to say certain things that he is going to claim that Islam is very united and agreed with respect to their view of God, right? Uh, that's just that's just a guess, but that, because that is a claim that Muslims make all the time, right? So e even though it's irrelevant for him to say, well, yeah, you guys are divided too, uh, because that's not the issue, it is, a, it is a devastating refutation of at least popular Dawaganda because they do claim all the time that their position is so clear that nobody disagrees on it. Yeah, right? and it's amazing so, because we're, yeah, we're going to finish this clip and we're going to see we're going to get the standard view, the standard Salafi view, and why, why there's this standard Salafi view, and you see why a lot of Muslims uh, have a problem with it. We have much more in common in terms of our actual values. We differ in terms of certain historical doctrines, but that's another story. On the other hand, you have so many different sects within Christianity, so many different denominations, mm. all of Not them disagree and consider the, each other to be heretics. So he for you to make that accusation and critique there. of Islam, I just don't think is correct. Just, it opens bro, up bro, bro, the history of the Catholics versus Protestants exactly. in Europe over five... <laughs> They're still talking about, but look, 500 years ago, you had Catholics. Notice, and no one's talking about any of this. You're missing it. Like, completely completely right. Notice how he pretended that the he downplayed the disunity among Muslims theologically. He pretended like that was 
nothing. Yeah, to really it's just speak it's of. just political played differences up, from history. Yeah, that's what he said. He played up the historical agreements between them. He he suggests, but then he turns around and he plays up the theological differences among Christians. Yeah, it, it's something of a shell and pea game there. All right, let's see. They killed each killed other. in the wake of the Protestant Reformation. So I mean, that's a. Um, that applies to Christianity more than Islam, but going back to the point is that you want to grow your numbers and the grow the Christian population. I want to help Christians grow because I think a world that has more Christians is better. I want to help Christians grow by killing all the apostates and blasphemers. It's than so a world that has more that atheists. Yeah. I'm but here how can you, you have more Christians when you don't really believe in the Bible? We have exactly. the seeds of the destruction of Christianity right in this podcast, because when you look at the way that Robert and Rashid describe the Bible, they describe it as a book of fables, and it can continue to evolve. I didn't say that. This is going Robert to, this is going to cause really. apostasy. This is going to cause a decrease in faith. Like, why should I take Christianity seriously when it just evolves and it changes over time? I can't no, connect my practices and my beliefs as a Christian today with the historical Jesus. So why am I going to maintain myself as a Christian? And then the, also the, the whole theology, which wait, we wait, haven't what, discussed at all today. Like, wait, what? What did he just say? He can connect his beliefs with the historical... Did he just say that? With the historical Jesus? No, uh, I think he was... Yeah, no, he he's saying he. So keep in mind, for in in his mind, uh, the the real Jesus promoted blasphemy laws and slaughtering everyone, and uh, so that's the real Jesus. And when you actually look at the commands that he commanded his his followers as part of the new covenant, you know, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, and so on. Put your sword down. Those who live by the sword will die by the sword. Things like that. That's not the real Jesus, and he can't connect to that. He's got lots of, he, but he's he's saying you got a problem in Christianity because you can't connect to the real bloody kill everyone, subjugate everyone, uh, just like you know he's just like Muhammad. You can't connect to the real Jesus, and so uh, that's why Christianity's got the problem. That's yeah. what he's pointing out. Ninety-five. Monotheism is. Uh, 80 to 90 percent of the world believes in monotheism in one God That's and true. monotheism is a central crucial the most important part of Islam the belief in one God without partners he is not like anything this is a very powerful belief that 80 to 90 percent of <clears throat> human beings profess in this day and age and Islam represents that in its theology and emphasizes Islam, represent, Islam represents 80 to 90 percent of the world's population. We're on your side, everyone. It's, it's not even true that that uh, monotheism represents uh, 80 to 90 percent of the world population's belief. I, I don't know where in the world he's getting that from, but uh, pretty sure it's it's around like roughly 60 percent or something like that. Well, he uh, has his studies. So unless you have something to repeat that. <laughs> that, that, that's yeah. the thing, like like. I don't know. I mean, I don't. I don't know where he's getting the number. Maybe there is. Maybe there is the number, but I can't trust him until I actually see it in front of my face and see it in co in the context of the article. Daniel is so messed up in the way he uh, cites sources and misrepresents them that you pretty much can't trust. It, as soon as he cites a statistic, you have to say, "Let me see that to see if you're right," because I can't trust you for it because you keep lying. This is that yeah, in its know theology? But if you, what's that? We know that Muslims see the number ninety in places where it doesn't exist, like Joseph Page. <laughs> So that's true. You have a trinity or you have a theology that is not really clear. Is Jesus God? Is there a Godhead? Is there this other system? Do we go by the Catholics or do we go by the Orthodox? Do we go by the Protestants? You don't have a consistent theology. Sunnis and Shias, they all agree on the on monotheism. God is one. He is not like anything. Oh, they agree on the Quran. Yeah, there can be some theological differences. Yeah, like. Dude, why, this, why, this, why gremlin, say, this gremlin body wait, that, that yeah. some... But why does he get to say, you know, when he pretends that they're all monolithic, he gets to say, oh yeah, there's some little differences. Why does he get to just decide that they're all little, but whenever it comes to Christianity, they're this huge monstrosity of a thing that, uh, you know, these things are at each other's throats. Uh, when he said, for example, he says, you know, they're, they're monotheists, they're all monotheists, and they have some little differences. Well, wouldn't all Christian branches wouldn't protestants roman catholics eastern orthodox all say that they're monotheists of course we mm -hmm. would right we i could speak the same way downplay the differences and play up the similarities and say that 
then these guys have this huge area. They really do. I mean, they're they're wildly divided. But I'm just saying he's playing a bit of a game here, right? Play up. The it's pretty bad. It's pretty bad. Yeah. Um, uh, a quick the, quote here, really quickly. Yeah, I, a, I, I just I just want to say the if you go to if you go to you have differences in how people view the Trinity uh, in in different groups and so on. I'd say those are those are all more similar. The, 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 the different models of the Trinity are more similar to each other than uh, Allah is this sort of mutant one legged thing hopping around on two feet versus no, that's that's just that's that's all uh, anthropomorphic metaphorical language. That's a massive difference. God has a body and actually has to, you know, travel around the universe and so on to hear people's prayers versus no, that's that's metaphorical language. There seems to be like massively. Uh, and, and keep in mind, these a, a bunch of the people from these other groups say, hey, you're not a real Muslim. No, your group isn't a real Muslim. No, that group isn't a real Muslim. No. So whatever these little tiny differences are, they're enough to exclude you from being a true Muslim. So I'd say they, they've got to be pretty, pretty big here the nuances between different schools but there's not the same kind of just uh, disparity or variance schools. between christian that's why we sects slaughter them in the and name of Allah. idea of the trinity which frankly no one can understand yeah. like what does it mean to be three in one <laughs> let, me to to any... uh, let, let, let me respond to that let me respond to that my brother is mentioning divisions between catholics and protestants if i go back there are divisions among the the follower, the disciples of Muhammad, the Sahaba themselves, yes. they killed each other. You know that the wife of Muhammad went and killed the followers of Ali in Mawqa'at al-Jamal. Thousands died among the first disciples. This, this didn't happen between Peter and John, by the way. <laughs> uh, so, guys, he's talking there about the Battle of the Camel. So this is after Muhammad's mm -hmm. death. And then there's a dispute over the way Ali deals with the people who uh, killed Uthman and Aisha doesn't like it. So Aisha actually marches an army against Ali. So this is Aisha, Muhammad's favorite wife, whose title is the mother of the faithful in Islam. She marches an army against Ali, Muhammad's son-in-law, whose title in Islam is the commander of the faithful. And you had Muslims on both sides of this battle who had fought alongside Muhammad at the Battle of uh, Battle of Badr and Uhud and so on. And now they're slaughtering each other in the name of Allah over their differences. So Rashid is pointing out you get Christians, you know, you get Catholics and Protestants fighting. You are you are a long time away from the time of Jesus, whereas in Islam, it's the first generation. And according to Sunni Islamic sources, that was the best generation. Muhammad said that his generation of Muslims were the best generations of Muslims ever. And so you put those two things together, the greatest generation of Muslims ever almost annihilated the entire generation by killing each other. And they're the best. They're the, they're the best of the best. Wow. Even when you go to uh, what happened immediately after um, the, the death of Muhammad, I mean, we have the... Uh, don't forget about the, the Ridda Wars, the, the Battle of Yamama. Uh, which, by the way, is what you say? What you say? Mama, mama. What? <laughs> <laughs> but so the, the infighting started immediately. The supposed rebellion, apostasy, uh, and then the infighting of the closest, the best uh, Sahaba. I mean, the, the the earliest generation of Muslims. They they were massacring each other. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So notice when you have when if you had Christians today killing each other, Christ, killing other Christians, they say, Ah, we have to go kill you. You can actually point to Jesus and his followers and show them com fr commands from Jesus and his followers saying, do not do that. Not definitely not to each other, not to other people either. Stop doing that. Stop going around killing and fighting. Um, in Islam, what, if you see Sunnis killing Shias or something like that, what do you, what do you say? Like, how do you tell them what Muhammad said? Muhammad said, I mean, it's in the Quran, Surah 9, verse 73. It's, it's wage jihad against unbelievers and hypocrites. So it's not just unbelievers, not just people who don't believe. It's people who believe but aren't doing it right. And say so, so to this day they say, oh, we have, as soon as you say, oh, we have to kill Shias and so on over this. So what do you even say when the best generation, the best generation of Muslims was slaughtering other Muslims over disagreements? How do you then say today, oh, stop killing, stop killing over your disagreements? Hmm. So. 
Oh, right. So That's if good. you go to yeah, Islam yeah. from the beginning, the, they, they fought each other and they had divisions from the beginning. You know that, for example, the fight over the Quran was created or eternal. They uh -huh. fought over that. And actually, yeah. one time they had the whole caliphate going one way. The other time, the prison, they killed people who believed that. So you're trying. Yes. Yeah, so at one time, the view that is dominant, that is the standard view. Later on, they'll kill people for holding that view once a different group rises to power. So it's amazing how Islam, the real Islam is decided by whoever wins the, the, the battle. And just to give a fake picture, there are divisions, there are killings among Muslims all through history, from the beginning, from the start, which didn't happen within Christianity, by Paul the way. Paul and Peter and uh, James uh, Oh, they didn't kill each other. <laughs> Paul and Peter <laughs> and James weren't at war? Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> Look at him. Huh? What? I thought they all killed each other. I thought they all killed each other. Let's see, Paul was killed by the Romans. No, Paul, Paul, it's a lie. He wasn't killed by the Romans. He was killed by, by John. Yeah, I'll just say that. No. no. <laughs> yeah. Paul, uh, Paul wasn't hey, killed by the Romans. It was only made to appear to them that that's what yeah, happened. Yeah, it was, really it was happened. actually James. James did it. So what can you actually say about divisions uh, in early Christianity? You did have a situation where Peter, because he's trying to win over uh, Jews to show them that, that Jesus is the Messiah, when he's when he's with when he's with the Jews, he would sort of uh, you know uh, not want to eat with the Gentiles because that might upset the Jews that he's trying to uh, uh, trying to share Jesus with. And Paul points him out, like, nope, you, that's too far. You can't do that. You can't do that. Uh, you you can't. You, you've got we're all one now. We're all one. We're all believers together. Stop Stop excluding these other groups. Uh, there's no killing each other and slaughtering each other over this stuff. But notice in Daniel's mind, hey, yeah, we're, you know, Aisha marched an army against Ali and thousands of Muslims died in bloody combat, slaughtering each other. Same thing. But you, got, you guys, you guys had a disagreement and one guy had to rebuke another. Oh, see, it's the same thing. Like, I don't know what to do with this guy, man. That this is the same guy again. I haven't I haven't seen it, but what I've heard is AP. What was the situation where he's saying something like, "If you make, if you make a girl, if you make it a rule that a girl has to go to school and she doesn't want to, that's basically the same thing as as what rape or something like this." That yeah, he, he he was saying, "Why are you against uh, you know marriage without uh, consent oh, yeah. when you are obviously for education without consent? Why why is why are you uh, okay uh, to?" Leave out consent. It's the one same thing. The same one. thing. Making kids go to school. It's the same thing as uh, you know forcing them into, into marriages against their will. It's the same thing. That's really that's really what he make, said. What yeah. he argued in the debate. So the, guys, mm. this is this is this guy's moral compass. Anything you object to over here, I mean, if he's go it doesn't matter what you're doing. Oh, you're, you're you're talking about the first generation of Muslims slaughtering each other. Well, the first generation of Christians had some disagreements. That's the same thing. It's the same. I don't know what to do, man. <laughs> All right, let's let him, let's let these guys finish here. They didn't kill each other because yeah, they didn't uh, have political uh, authority. Uh, okay. Oh wow! Were they fighting okay. each other? Who yes killed? Or no? Who killed Ottoman, for example? Who killed Paul and who, Peter and James? Were they at war? Were they fighting? Did were they? They, were they, they, they were not fighting. Okay, they weren't. Fight is to take an army against yeah. another one. Aisha if took an army and have, killed people. If you don't have an army. I, okay, you don't have political a, power. You have. You lost You lost your argument. You are trying to make a false analogy here. You lost yes. your argument. This is not also, an analogy. You're not going to. You're, you're not going to win uh, over any Christians by the making constructing these them. straw man arguments that completely misrepresent. But, but, and, what and, and I let's say, say, say this. But the, if I may, the, so uh, just, notice Daniel's. Yeah, what he was saying there. So his his point there was um, uh, the reason they didn't kill and slaughter each other is they didn't have an army. But if they did, they would have killed each uh, other. It's ridiculous. Rashid says uh, the early Muslims, the earliest Muslims, the best generation, they fought and massacred each other to no end. Uh, then Daniel says, well, you know, the the early Christians, they also they had disagreements. Well, they didn't massacre each other. Well, they, they probably would have if they had power. What kind of an idiotic? This is, this is too much. man. Yeah. And so and by the way, there are multiple problems with that. Right. Uh, he says, why weren't they killing and slaughtering each other? Well, they didn't have political power. Uh, so, so two things. One, no, they were commanded not to. You're commanded. You're commanded not to be killing each other. You are commanded not to be slaughtered. That was a command from Jesus. There's nothing that comes later that somehow abrogates that like in Islam. The other problem is 
you don't have to have political power to fight, right? Yeah. You don't. You don't have to think in mind all these uh, all these Islamic terrorist attacks that we have, right? When someone when someone crashes planes into buildings or blows up a train, they don't have they don't have the political authority to do that. Happened. They just, they just, yeah. they believe, Hey, uh, you know, I can't, I can't take, I can't conquer you with an army, but I can still kill a bunch of people. And you've had that, you've had that, uh, all along in Islam. So where's he getting matter of fact, even in the Bible, right? The stoning of Stephen, the people who did that did not have the authority to do that. You did not have political authority. You were controlled by the Romans did it anyway. The apostle Paul was stoned. People picked up, he, he out, he enraged people so much. They picked up stones to stone him to death. He survived. They did not have political authority to do that. So you don't have to have political authority to get mad and enraged and go on a killing spree. Um, so Daniel's point is just ridiculous. But guys, everyone, uh, if you don't, uh, if you don't take anyone, take anything else away from this discussion, just get a basic timeline. Christians didn't kill anyone for centuries. In fact, one of the, one of the earliest objections that we have on record from the Christians is that they were viewed as traitors because they wouldn't go to the gladi gladiatorial games, right? They wouldn't go. They didn't want to watch people fighting and slaughtering each other. But that was that was viewed as a big part of unity in the Roman Empire and so on. And they were condemned. You guys don't want to see people uh, slaughtering each other. And so you're you're bad. And you actually go through centuries. You go through centuries. Christians don't, sh don't shed a drop of blood, even though they're being killed and persecuted. And they could have been, at least in the... in. Uh, you could, they could have justified fighting back. Hey, we're getting killed. We're getting persecuted. They didn't. It's when the Roman empire adopts Christianity. That's when you start getting, now notice it's not Christians expanded and grew into something to where they're dominant. And then violence arises within Christianity. They decide, oh yes, now we finally have the political power. We can go on killing sprees. It's an empire adopts Christianity. An empire that was that already had a Roman Empire kind of way of doing things adopts Christianity, and then you get fighting. Yeah. Uh, so this did, the quickly. point. The point is this doesn't spontaneously arise from within Christianity. It gets added to it from from without. Go ahead, Anthony. Mm -hmm. I was reminded of a quote from Anthony Flew back uh, in his atheist days. Do you he keep wrote calling him? Do you keep calling him Anthony to make him sound like you? That is Anthony. Not his name. Anthony. Anthony. Okay, good. That's what I called him. Um, so this, uh, back in, uh, free inquiry, they, uh, I don't know that they still, they probably don't produce a hard copy anymore, but they used to do the magazine. Maybe it's all online now, but anyways, uh, in 2001, after nine 11, they decided to devote an issue to Islam before that it was more general. They would talk against theism because it's an atheist periodical and focus mostly on Christianity because that was the context, of the Christian West. But Islam caught their attention, so they did an article on, or a whole issue on Islam. Anyways, Anthony flew in there. There's a statement that was so memorable to me, it, it stuck in my mind, but he said, whereas Christianity for the first 300 years of its remarkable expansion gained most of its converts through peaceful persuasion, Islam already in the latter years of Muhammad's own lifetime was gaining most of its converts by means of military uh, conquest. So he was he was making this observation that as much as we don't like Christianity and disagree with it on philosophical and ideological and other grounds, uh, nevertheless, they're not going to cut our throats. <laughs> it was kind of what he was saying. He said, we got to worry about these guys. Uh, so yeah. it, it is historically known that uh, that early that there were um, plenty of early Christian uh, figures that we know. We, we mentioned uh, Tertullian just just yesterday, I believe, who um, are known to have spread the, the idea that Christians should not engage in any form of violent activities uh, because it would go against their, their um, you know, against the teachings of Christ or against the, the Christian way of, of living, which is why they were, by the way, uh, early on um, discriminated against or, you know, ridiculed or persecuted by, uh, in, the, in the Roman Empire. But uh, this guy really thinks the only reason the Christians didn't uh, fight each other was that they didn't have power. If they if they had power, they would have uh, become much worse, much more violent than the Muslims, of course. <laughs> yeah, got to be that way. Um, all right. So, <laughs> Anthony, it, it actually took uh, a bit longer to go through that clip than uh, than I anticipated, mainly because uh, AP can't stop talking. But, uh, 
All right. We'd like a crash course. Matter of fact, we, we need to come back on a future date where you can lay out a full, a full picture of uh, Salafi, the Salafi view of God. But people really don't seem to understand that certain groups of Muslims for with with some textual support, they have reasons for thinking this way, actually believe that Allah is a physical being, uh, something that has body parts. And this gets ridiculed <laughs> by other Muslim groups. But yes, it is a cause of massive division. But I mean, it's pretty fundamental. You believe that God has body parts. I believe that God doesn't have body parts. Uh, what's going on here? So uh, why don't you yeah. give us a little? Why don't you give us a little crash course with some of your favorite examples of points that that would cause them to to claim that Allah has body parts? And then yeah, we'll have a we'll have a fuller discussion in a in a future uh, episode. Okay. Try so to make it, first, uh, try to make it not longer than one minute. Yeah, one minute. Get everything in one minute. <laughs> yeah. So first thing, you remember Daniel claims that these are incidental or insignificant little differences. Here is an Islamic authority. This is Al-Tamimi in his book, The Most Beautiful Names and Lofty Attributes. The Allah, this is the subtitle, The Belief of Al-Al-Sunna wa al Jama. So this is claiming by the title and subtitle to be an accurate account of Islamic Akita. Listen to what he says and ask yourself, is this what Daniel was saying as he downplayed the differences? The realm of the names and attributes of Allah is regarded to be one of the most dangerous areas, one of the most dangerous areas because of the fact that it has been the subject of severe and complex differences. Okay, that's what you heard Daniel saying, right? It's, it's, they're just, uh, right, the severe complex differences. No, it's the entire opposite of what Daniel was saying. And this is an actual Islamic authority, a Salafi, by the way, somebody that would agree with them theologically. He's saying, no, those other groups hold altogether reprehensible views about Allah that we can't tolerate. He even goes on, same quote, to say just what Rashid was saying. A war broke out between the Salaf at one end. That's, he's using the term Salaf to say the group that he favors, right? And the philosophers, or al-Kalam, the scholastic Muslims, and the Mushabiha, what he's calling the anthropomorphists, at the other Hence, it is from the oblig obligatory duties of the student of knowledge to profoundly understand to a deep level the truth that is based upon the book and the sunnah. So there is a competent Islamic authority, and, and that's just one example. I, you know, I could give you more examples than the number of women Muhammad slept with in a day, right? The, the Muslim authorities who know what they're talking about mm -hmm. actually admit that it's not all that simple. It is complex. The differences are severe, and it results in some real dangerous uh things i, I couldn't yeah. tell if david was going to say yeah oh no yeah i, I want to i want uh, I, i'm mainly concerned right here with people understanding why there is uh why someone might think that yeah. allah is uh physical and so you know here i'm thinking well we hang on hang on we, we definitely want to uh get the, the I'm trying to think of which one is like the the clearest, but you have the the two hands issue that Allah that creates the... with Allah creates with His hand, so that's a good example. And then uh, in the Hadith, there are all kinds of issues, but uh, one of the most difficult to reinterpret, and therefore what provides a lot of justification in the minds of these groups is like Allah's shin and so on. And then for mm -hmm. sort of the the wider context about how these uh, claims were more prominent in the past, maybe you could. Talk about when Allah made the the statue of Adam and, oh, and how and, how that was, his, yeah. So those kinds of let me, was, let me just let me just let me just check this uh, quick comment real quick. Uh, why two arms <laughs> on one side? Oh, just wanted to share. I'll go a quick, there. <laughs> no, I just wanted to share a quick uh, quick story from this. So uh, you do your unright you do your unrighteous deeds with your left, and you know your righteous deeds with your right, and therefore Allah's not going to be doing anything bad. So therefore He, he would only have two right hands but uh it was funny when this got this got brought up in prison when i didn't know i didn't know much of anything about islam but a muslim was explaining to us uh it was me and my spades partner my spades partner uh i don't even remember what his real name was he went he went by ghost but uh my spades partner a muslim was breaking things down to us and stuff and he says you i i do you do your unrighteous you do your unrighteous deeds with your left hand your righteous deeds with your right and uh <laughs> My spades partner, Ghost, goes, 
Well, that's good to know. So next time I shoot someone, I'll just do it with my left hand. I'm good, right? It goes right back to it goes right back to what we were doing. I just, that's always stuck in my mind. I thought that was funny. But go ahead, Anthony. <laughs> yeah. So I actually, so in terms of what is most prominently talked about, where we have the most material from the Quran and the Sunnah and the Islamic scholars, it is the hands of Allah. They're not the only attributes. The sources talk about Allah's face. They talk about his eyes, multiple eyes, so more than two. It talks about his two right hands, but also there's one hadith that mentions a left hand, which is kind of curious. I don't know how this works out, but the dominant opinion is three he has two hands, right and not a left. Yeah, but <laughs> we, have case, to fix, uh, we have to fix our about picture. A shin. It talks about two feet because the cursey is the place for the feet. Allah has a cursey. Uh, it talks about his side. So there are a number of anatomical features that are mentioned, including the the loins of Allah. So you have this primordial womb that's presented in in the hadiths which are curiously sort of expunged from certain collections of Bukhari and Muslim. But I've got the goods on that. Livnat Holtzman, who's a Jewish scholar, has written an excellent book on this. But anyways, uh, th that's the account where the womb reaches up and grabs Allah where it counts, and Allah says, stop it. And he, uh, I'm sure that when he said it, he was, it was like, stop it. He couldn't have said that with a normal masculine voice, right? So he had to... He, had to <laughs> no, he said it with an Ali Dawa voice. Yeah. Stop it! Yeah, yeah. Blow this <laughs> so that those are all fun, and there's there's material there. There's all kinds of material, but the hands of Allah are mentioned in a lot of different contexts. You can't just make this figurative and make it all go away. When yeah, but, I read the Quran, yeah, hang on. Let, let me let me let me jump in with it with the standard objection. I know you're I know you're already going to cover it, but I just want to make it as clear as possible that you are responding to this objection, because no matter how many times you say it, you can say it 50,000 times in a row, people raise the exact same objection and completely miss the point. Um, the objection is, but wait a minute, you have all these passages in the Bible where it talks about God's eyes or this or that. So, you know, this is clearly just anthropomorphic language, and these things are metaphors for understanding something else. And so I, I know you're going to point out why we are aware of that. And Muslim theologians are aware of that. And yet they conclude that he has a he actual has li, he has literal body parts because that resp that response that I just gave does not work. There, there are people who aren't yeah. going to interpret these metaphorically or uh, anthropomorphically. They they have to interpret them literally as referring to actual body parts. Tell us why mm -hmm. that is, Anthony. Yeah, so when it comes to the Bible, it uses figures of speech just like we all do in day-to-day -day conversation. So Psalm 19, poetic passage of the Bible, says the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. That has always been recognized by Christians as an idiomatic expression. God created things by his hands just is just a way of saying by his power. I know that being steeped in the Bible so that when I went to the Quran, I had no automatic prejudice here with respect to this sort of thing. I wasn't looking to try and force the Quran into a literalistic mold. I assumed that when it uses terms like this, it's using them figuratively too. However, there were a number of things that I started to you know, stumble over and I thought, well, I don't know that I can deal honestly with this and, and take it figuratively. And here's the first thing that caught me short. Surah 3875 bring, is one of the many passages of the Quran that talk about Allah commanding the angels and Satan with them to bow down to Adam. Other statements about this just mention that he, would, he were commanded to do so, Satan didn't do so, so Satan's uh, in trouble with Allah for that reason. But Surah 3875 gives us a reason. Allah says to Satan on that occasion, how could you refuse to bow down to the one that I created with my own two hands? Now, think about this. Mm -hmm. If Allah is saying that the reason Satan and the other angels should have bowed down to Adam is because they were made with his two hands, and if all that means is, idiomatically, that every, they were created with Allah's power, then Satan and the angels have just as much reason to bow down to everything as they do to Adam. But this is being given to single Adam out as an appropriate object of prostration, right? You're supposed to bow down to Adam because he was made with my two hands. Now, uh, when you go to the Hadith, this hang becomes on, hang on, all— Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. 
I, I want people to understand that because they're not going to understand anything else without that. And mm-hmm. if they if they don't understand anything else about all this, they need to get that point that you just made. So, guys, when when we read when when let's say Christians read in the Bible that God created with his hands, we don't think that he's actually doing something with his hands. We think this is just, you know, this is just an expression for God's power. He created everything with his hands. Um, same thing with, you know, God's eyes see this, see this or that, and so on. We, we don't, we're not interpreting this as actually referring to God's uh, body parts. And so you could say, hey, when, when Muslims are reading the Quran and they see, you know, these references to Allah's body parts, they could conclude the same thing. What Anthony just pointed out was, and it's the same thing Muslim theologians have pointed out, there are passages where it doesn't, that doesn't work. That sort of that sort of understanding doesn't work, it because it seems it if it's if it's something if it's something metaphorical it doesn't work. So what Anthony was just pointing out was when Allah says that He created Adam with His hands, with His two hands. This is why you should bow down to them. If Allah doesn't actually have hands, keep in mind what we're saying right now is exactly the arguments that Muslim theologians who believe that Allah has body part. This is what they say. This is this is the basis of their. I mean, they have a bunch of other arguments for this, but this is the fundamental idea. The Quran says that Allah created with His hands. That's why everyone needs to bow down to Adam because Allah created with His hands. Okay, what if it's not literal hands? What if it's not actual hands, and that's just a metaphor for something? What's it? Okay, what's it a metaphor for? Oh, it's, when it says Allah did something with his hands, it's just a metaphor for his power. That makes no sense. That makes no sense because the reason that all these other beings that Allah created with his power are supposed to bow down to Adam is because Allah created Adam with his hands. So it can't, it can't be a reference. Talking about Allah's hands can't be a reference to his power. It can't just, it can't be an expression that is describing Allah's power because Allah created everything with his power. He's saying, yes, hey, all you things that I created with my power, you need to bow down to this thing because I created that thing with my with my own hands. Hands can't hands can't be some can't can't be a metaphor there. Right? Everything God created everything with his power. He's saying there's something different about this guy. What's different about this guy? Well, this guy I created with my hands. So hands can't be a metaphor for power, something like that. It has to mean something else. And so one way of going with this, uh, it's the direction that Salafis go. Fala says he has hands and he's got hands, so he has actual body parts. And then running with that, when they see these other descriptions about a lot of shin and feet and so on, it's, it's, it's telling us that he has actual body parts and there's no way, there's no way around it without messing up the text. Uh, go ahead, Anthony. Right. So what reinforces this now not only are there other statements about Allah's hands in the Quran, but when you turn to the Hadith, and I'm just going to mention one that is especially significant when, again, many could be mentioned, but this Hadith is especially significant because it's a mutawatir Hadith. It's mass narrated. So it's not one that Muslims can play the typical games with, oh, that's weak, that's da'if, that's this, that's that. It's it's mutawatir. It's, it's as good as gold in the area of Hadith. Well, and you're all going to remember this, right? When I bring it up, you're going to say, oh, that Hadith. Yeah, okay. It's the Hadith of intercession. When when the people on the day of resurrection are waiting to be judged, they're going to be growing anxious, right? The sun's going to be beating down on them. Allah's very mo- immodest. He has everybody standing there naked, men and women and so forth. He doesn't care that they're all naked, right? And he's, he's looking on from heaven, enjoying the spectacle and, and so forth. But in any case, it says uh, that people are going to grow anxious during this time. And they're going to seek out somebody that they think might have a chance of prevailing with Allah, right? Ask, ask Allah to bring about the day of judgment and get us out of this situation where we're sitting here cringing Just about his judgment. Get it right? over with. Yeah. yeah, let's let's do this thing, right? So, so what what they do is they start thinking of who can possibly have the ear of Allah, who might be able to prevail with him. The first person they think to go to is Adam. Now, I'm going to skip over a little bit of this and come back to it because you need to see something of the flow of this to get the logic of what's happening here. Adam is going to say, I sin, my Lord's angry with me, go therefore to Noah. Right? Noah's going to do the same thing. I sinned, go to Abraham. Abraham's going to do the same thing. I sinned, go to Moses. Moses will say, I sinned, go to David. David will say, 
go to Jesus, you know, because I sin. Now, Jesus, interestingly, doesn't say I sinned. Muhammad can't bring up anything here, but he does have Jesus say, go to Muhammad. Now, here's what I've skipped over. Notice that these people are all seeking out somebody that they think can prevail with Allah. Attached to each one of these persons is something special or unique about them in the very Hadith that I'm talking about. So the reason people are told, for example, to go to Abraham is because he was called the friend of Allah. And so it's assumed Abraham might be able to get Allah to have mercy on us. But Abraham says he can't. Well, David, he was the man after God's own heart. That's why he stands out. Moses was the man to whom God spoke directly. That's what the Hadith says, right? Jesus is singled out because he is Allah's word and a spirit from him, like the Quran says. Well, what do you think is given as the stated reason why Adam is special, right? These are all these special things about these individuals that stand out. What's special about Adam? What's special about Adam is he was made with Allah's own two you know, hands, right? This, again, cannot mean something metaphorical. Everything was created by Allah's hands. And this hadith presupposes that this is literal, right? Now, Guys, well, guys, funny... I, I, guys I, I want everyone to understand the point again before Anthony continues, right? It's what's special about Adam in that whole, in that hadith. What's special and unique about Adam is he was created with Allah's hands. That's what makes him different from everyone else. So can Allah's hands there simply be a metaphor for his power? No, Allah creates everything with his power. He created the universe with his power. So there's something completely different about Adam that both the Quran and Muhammad in the Hadith say the difference is Allah created him with his hands. If Allah has no hands, what in the name of common sense is the difference? It makes no sense. And therefore, uh, so again, not every Muslim goes in this direction. Not even not even every Muslim who believes in the Sunni Hadith uh, goes this direction. But we want you to understand there are reasons for uh, entire sects of Islam concluding that Allah has actual body parts. Go ahead, Anthony. What if, what if he Go. does have real hands, but they are metaphorical hands? He has real metaphorical hands. Yeah. <laughs> it's a mystery. <laughs> well, what here's here's something we could spend a lot of time on. I'll just mention briefly, but what they typically like to do is bring up Surah 42.11 and 112.4. Those are the passages where it says there's nothing like Allah and there's nothing comparable to him. However, those statements in their context are not making these grand metaphysical claims that Muslims try to use them to to push, right? It's not saying that these things are being used for Allah, but we don't understand their modality, right? That's what Muslims will often say. We, 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 we say that he has hands, but we don't say how. We don't ask how. But that's, that's their escape card, but Bit that's that not case. what those passages are talking about. If you look at Surah 4211 in the context, you know what it's talking about? It's talking, it says that Allah has created everything with its mate. Everything has a mate. So people have mates, you have a person and their spouse, animals all have their mates, that's how they produce offspring. But it says Allah, there's nothing like him, meaning he has no mate, he has no female counterpart. Now, it doesn't tell us if that's just because Allah didn't meet the right lucky lady or anything else. All it's saying is he does not have a counterpart like everything else does. That's why he doesn't produce. And by the way, if you look at Surah 112 closely, and you actually interpret the word there in uh, the second verse accurately, then you understand it's making the same point. When it says, say he is Allah, the one, he be, uh, the eternal, he begets not, neither is he begotten. What it literally says in Arabic is say that he is Allah, the one, he is solid, he does not beget, nor is he begotten. In other words, Allah is not hollow, right? He, he doesn't have a cavity, he can't produce offspring. So there's there's a blockage down there. It, it, it's not indicating. That's why Allah doesn't go to the bathroom. It's not because he doesn't have a backside. He does have a backside, and I could give you the hadith for that. He's got a backside. Yeah, Satan I think we. I think we actually. That. Yeah, I think we actually have some info on that, don't we? Yeah, if you want me to give it, I didn't know how much time you were going to give me, but uh, it's one of my he, favorite stories. Yeah, why don't you? Why this don't you share. Be, these should be re these should be re required bedtime stories for our children, like uh, fairy tales and stuff. So, okay, Definitely here's the story. One. Matter so of fact, we should all experiment. We should all tell our kids <laughs> this this story <laughs> that Anthony's about to share. Uh, guys, this if you one... if you want to share something on Twitter, you can share. You can uh, download this video and take this little uh, this little story out and share it. Yeah. So, <laughs> according to the Sunni hadiths, 
uh, Allah created Adam in his own shape and form. Allah created Adam 90 feet tall, right? Uh, there's all sorts of things that indicate that Adam, as Allah's image bearer, was taken to mean his literal physical duplicate, right? So that sort of sets the context for some of the Hadith narrations given by Al-Tabari. Al-Tabari is the cream of the crop with respect to some of the uh, information we have of Islam. He's got all kinds of stuff with respect to tafsir, with respect to history and so forth. But in any case, uh, Tabari, who, by the way, he's got a whole chain going back to Muhammad telling us that the word in Surah 112 means solid. I wasn't just pulling that out of nowhere. Right. It's Al-Tabari who, who really gives us solid information there. Not to, you know, <laughs> anyway. So no pun intended. Uh, right. Yeah. 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 So uh, here's the story in Al-Tabari. So you have to know this backdrop or it won't make sense until the end. But the, the story is that Allah created Adam as a lifeless statue first, and he caused him to stand erect for a long period of time. Okay, before he breathed life into him. So he first fashions him with those literal two hands that he has into a statue with, that's lifeless. And he causes it to stand erect. Well, so one day the angels are, are traipsing about and they, they happen upon this statue of Adam and they're initially frightened. Okay, this, this statue, they don't expect to see this and they're now alarmed. Now, for me as a Christian, I, I'm thinking, why would angels, given their description in our sources and so forth, be afraid of some other beings? That just doesn't comport, you know. But when ah, you read the statue. Islamic sources, yeah, it's a little different, right? Like when, when the angel of death came to Muhammad and told him that he was going to take well, his soul. Well, hang on, hang on. They remember, are, they, remember they, what are Muhammad did? they are terrified of images, though, by the way. But yeah, go ahead. Anthony. Yeah, and dogs and stuff, yeah. <laughs> but remember, in, this, in the Hadith, the, it says that when the angel of death went to Muhammad, and told him that he was going to take his soul. Muhammad punched him in the eye, and his eye popped out. And the angel went back to Allah, complaining, and Allah was nice enough to stick the eye back in. But anyway, so these angels are afraid, right? They're, they're really afraid of this statue, and you have to wonder why, though. I mean, they're, they're supposed to be fantastically powerful spiritual beings. Why are they afraid of this statue? Well, anyways, as the story goes, Satan happens upon them, and he says to them, in effect... I'll go over there, fellas, and I'll check this out, and then I'll come back to you. So Satan ends up being more courageous than the rest of them, right? They're all a bunch of whimpering cowards. Satan's like, I'm going to investigate. I'll I'm going to go see out. what's happening. Yeah, it's yeah. weird how Satan's always the real hero behind this. Yeah, yeah. He doesn't he commit right? shirk. He right? refuses yeah. to, to bow down, right? Yeah. He's, he's the one who sa he's, he's the one who saves everyone because Allah's going to destroy us if we don't <laughs> sin, and Satan convinces us to sin. He saves us. He's, the, he's our hidden uh, hero behind the scenes. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. So what happens is Satan goes over to the statue and then he goes in its mouth and then he goes out through its butt. Mm -hmm. And then he comes back to the angels. And here's what he says. Don't worry. That is hollow. But your Lord is solid. In other words, if that was Allah, I wouldn't have been able to exit through his rear because Allah is solid down there. He's plugged up, right? He's he's there's no cavity down there. Yeah, now this does, gave how, rise. How does Satan know that, by the way? Did he try? Or? <laughs> uh, I guess yeah, he probably tried on another occasion that we're not told about or that I don't know about. But yeah, this guys, is so, what so, gives guys, rise. So, notice, to, so so Allah is solid. He's actually solid. Um, it, but he doesn't have a complete digestive tract that goes all the way through his body. And that's how Satan is actually able to distinguish this from, from the right. actual Allah. So there were even debates among certain Muslims over the extent to which Allah is solid. So you had some saying he's solid from the waist down. You had others who extended the solidity of Allah up further. But they always had to leave room for the ability for Allah to speak, right? Because he's, he speaks. So you, you've got to at least have, uh, you know, a chest cavity or something. You know, you've, you've got to have the ability to speak. So there were actually debates. Now, now think about this really quickly. This makes so much sense and puts together so many things. If you look at the supposed occasion for the revelation of Surah 112, remember all these surahs came down in response to certain things. The, the, the surah came down in response, some sources say, to the questions of certain pagans, some say to the questions of certain Jews. So some Muslim authorities trying to harmonize these will say that Jews and, and pagans both asked the same question at different periods. But here's the question that Muhammad was so, supposedly responding to. 
The question was, what is your Lord made of, right? Is he something substantial, right? Is he something tangible? And if if Surah 112 isn't making reference in some way to that, then it's not, I don't see how these two things go together, the supposed occasion of revelation and what it says in Surah 112. But once you realize that the word means solid, all of a sudden it makes sense. And so do many other things. Think about it. It's In this statement, it says, Say he is Allah the one, he is solid, he begets not, neither is he begotten. He doesn't beget because he doesn't have the cavity, right? He's he's not he's not capable of ejecting things from inside of himself, right? He's solid. Mm-hmm. That all hangs together remarkably well, and it's not me making this up, right? It's not AP. It's not you. Any any other Christian? This is in their sources, and it, it harmonizes what we find in the Hadith collections, even the the sound Sunni. And by the way, really quickly before I forget, so many other Hadiths make reference to Allah stroking Adam's back when. Allah took out his progeny and made them stand before him and confess him as the true God. This is the account, by the way, when they talk about a uh, fitrah, how everybody's born being a Muslim. They don't think of that in terms of like natural revelation like Christians do, like God reveals himself through nature and conscience. They think Allah literally made all of us come out of Adam and stand before him. But notice where Allah's stroking, right? First of all, he's stroking Adam's back with his hand. Again, he's got a literal hand. He's stroking Adam's back. Why? Because where does semen come from? From between the backbone and the ribs, right? So, so it goes on and on. We're told that hey, you got to be careful talking first... about stroking with all these comments I'm reading right now. Well, uh, it's it's, <laughs> hey, uh, you know, it's uh, Muhammad. Yeah. People uh, with, with the stuff about you know uh, Satan coming out of the butt and stuff like this, yeah. and uh, <laughs> it, it led to lots of comments, and then you immediately start using a term which. <laughs> All these perverts over here. And you are perverts, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. It's it's in the Quran and the Hadith. Surah 7 talks about the progeny of Adam being ta- brought out. The tafsirs explain what that's talking about. We're told in the Hadith that there's a debate between Adam and Moses. Uh, Moses goes to Adam and he says, Are you that Adam that got us kicked out of paradise, even though Allah made you with his own two hands? And then we're actually told in the Hadith that Adam got the better of Moses, even though it sounds like Moses had a really good... Uh, jab at, at Adam. Mm-hmm. Adam turns around and says, are you that Moses for whom Allah wrote the Torah with his own hand? Mm-hmm. He says, "Did you know, and, and the point that he's making is you had a privilege just like I did. I was made with Allah's two hands. You had the Torah with, that he wrote with his hands. But he says, you're, you're to be excused for blaming me because the Torah existed before you possessed it. It was created 40 years before I was made. And so you knew that this was decreed for me is basically what Adam is saying. But again, it's talking about these two hands. One other thing really quickly is you have numerous statements in these sources that say that Allah only created three or four things with his own hands. This, this just pushes it beyond deniability. They say that Allah created Adam with his two hands. He planted the trees of the Garden of Eden with his two hands. He wrote the Torah for Moses with his two hands, and he created the pen with his hands. Those are the four things. That's why it makes sense when Allah in Surah 3875 says, how can you refuse to bow down to Satan whom I created with my own two hands? Adam really was special. Mm -hmm. He was distinguished from the generality of other created things by virtue of this. That's, That's why so many Muslims think this is to be taken literally. That's why so many Muslims... Uh, aren't just being arbitrary or overly literalistic when they do that. There's there's mm-hmm. ample material in their sources to conclude this. So you have people who have good reasons, given their trust in the Muslim sources, to think that Allah has actual body parts, and that's why there are entire sects of Islam uh, that believe that Allah has literal body parts. And you have Muslims who just, that, that sounds ridiculous to them. And so they can't they can't buy it. And so they have to they have to interpret this. Um, it's a little easier if you reject the Sunni sources because, you know, you're not dealing with a ton of examples in the Quran, although, uh, as you pointed out, there are some. Um, so, yeah. But the point is, guys, uh, disagreements over whether Allah has literal body parts or not. That's pretty big difference in theology, actual physical God versus uh, immaterial God. Uh, Rory here uh, says, Jesus, going back to the points we were discussing earlier, Jesus rebuked his disciples when they asked him to rain down fire from heaven, uh, saying, you do not know what spirit you are of. This is the Jesus of the Bible. So 
this is referring to people, uh, hey, if they reject Jesus, should we call down fire on them? And Jesus says, no, you, know, you know what spirit you're following right now. But notice, Daniel says that's, ex Daniel would say that's exactly what they should have done. Um, and it, well, it's just because they didn't have political power that they did. Well, that makes no sense, right? So anyway, so yeah, we got these problems. Uh, we have Black Angel here. <laughs> There are a bunch of comments along these lines that were a little confused as to uh, uh, what's going on with Allah and why Satan can't crawl out of him and so on. And so uh, wasn't he wearing a leather strap? <laughs> so, so I know we there's need, a background need, of some of this, but I haven't kept up on the whatever the background. Are you talking about the leather left. strap? Yeah, I don't know what this it's is It's a about. hadith that we started. I mean, <laughs> I'd seen it before. It's just one of the ones you sort of gloss through. It's not saying anything important. But one day we were alive and someone said, <laughs> why, don't you, why don't you look at this? And I like, sat there and looked at it. I'm like, what the heck is it? But it's in Sunan Abu Dawud and, and a bunch of other mm. hadiths. And uh, uh, Muhammad says, the eyes are the leather strap of the anus. <laughs> and so, <laughs> but this is the same guy who said that one of the one of his miracles that he's been sent with these such profound brilliant uh ways of speaking and so on the the eyes are the leather strap of the anus and ap was trying to explain it to me and, th and i had to read it in a bunch of versions with some commentary and the claim was the the idea is that when you go to sleep your eyes are closed and so the leather strap is is referring to like the leather strap on a water bottle and so the leather strap on a water bottle holds holds the bottle closed but your eyes are the leather strap of your anus. When your eyes are asleep, then the leather strap is undone and you don't know what's going to leak out of your rear end. And that's why you have to do your uh, do your washings <laughs> because you don't know what's going to come out. Yeah. And so, yeah. 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 So the, po the point is, it's like, wait, this is the guy bragging about his brilliant way of explaining things. And the best way he could come up with, hey, guys, you don't know what's going to come out of your rear end uh, while you're asleep because you don't have you're not you're not you don't have control, uh, the complete control over things. Uh, so this is why you have to do your washings. And so the best way he could illustrate that is the eyes are the leather strap of the anus. So that's what we keep laughing about. We've never gotten over that. Uh, we have, uh, Eli Shamoon. It's Ellie, but he says that sounds like a girl to American. So Eli, uh, he says, uh, uh Oh, it's going to get good. AP. To see this is going to send AP into a, it's going to send AP into a rage. But uh, he says, The Blind Watchmaker by Mr. Delusional Dawkins, AP's hero, what? too blind to see The Watchmaker by David Wood. What do you think? Love and miss you, brother. Hi, uh, Anthony. Hi, AP. You're uh, finished, boy. AP is going to go into a rage because uh, Eli just took a shot at Dawkins, the hero of atheists everywhere. It's a holy prophet. <laughs> Hey, uh, hey, Eli! You should check out this video. I'm about to. Uh, it's not. It's not uh, about Dawkins, but uh, I'm about to post one about our good friend Sam Harris. Send AP mm. into a, all kinds of rages this week. Yeah. Um. All right. So, so ladies and gentlemen, does everyone understand? Does everyone understand why there are entire sects of Islam that conclude that Allah has actual body parts, and why this is an ongoing? source of division. Notice, I mean, for one group, we've seen it. We've seen it from Mufti Abu Layth when he's just cracking up laughing at people's description of Allah as having physical body parts. He just finds it all ridiculous. And yet the Salafis who believe that Allah does have these body parts, they look at him as like, well, you're just not taking what Allah says seriously. And so, you know, he views, he views them as morons and they view him as this compromiser who refuses to obey Allah. And so he's not really submitted to Allah. And, uh, and so that's the situation yeah, and, we have in the world. And by the way, we're only focused here on two differences among Muslims. This isn't the full range of options, no, even it on gets way deeper, yeah. right? There's the Jahmiya, the Muatizali, the Ashuris, the Maturidis. I mean, you could go on and on. And then there are differences among all of those groups. Mm -hmm. So nobody should think that this represents the end of it, though this is a pretty ugly end, yep. right? One end, at least. Mm -hmm. uh, Scarlet here says, was castration a thing in Muhammad's day? Uh, yeah, that was actually the basis for uh, Muhammad allowing his followers to practice mutta, which is prostitution. You just you know, instead of just sleeping with the prostitute, you marry her for an hour and then it's all it's all totally 100 percent halal certified. But yeah, his, his companions, they're on a military campaign and it's, oh, we're, we're away from our wives. Should we get castrated? It's like, no, go ahead and practice muta. 
Uh, so just go, just hire some prostitutes. Notice it's never, hey, just control yourselves. Get some self-control, guys. Um, and then, of course, later they would cra they would castrate their slaves and so on to keep them from, you know, so you didn't have to be worried about your slave around your wife or something like that. So the answer is yes. But let's go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and wrap up this show with uh, a video of Khalil talking to our good friend Jake, the Muslim metaphysician, to point out some of the serious differences. So again, uh, Khalil is a an, is an Ismaili Shia and a uh, well, he, he's a, he's a scholar. And he's talking to Jake, the Muslim metaphysician. And guys, I recommend watching it because, I mean, there's a ton of information there about the disagreements over theology. You you have no idea how many differences uh, there are over theology uh, in Islam. But here we're towards the end, and Khalil is going through his... Oh, first he's got the end of the cross-examination. The entire cross-examination where Khalil is cross-examining Jake is uh, is awesome because Jake obviously does not want to answer. He knows he's getting cornered on all of these things. But uh, we'll look at two clips. I spliced them together. One is Khalil pointing out the implications of Jake's view because Jake believes that Allah actually descends as the Hadith uh, declares. And then um, Khalil after that is going to grade Jake on his debate performance. But this is, again, this is all to illustrate that you have people with one view and you have other people who just think it's silly and ridiculous, all under the umbrella of Islam. So not as united as uh, PBD thinks, but let's check this out a little bit. Okay. Are you able to point me in the direction of Allah's throne? His mic's off. He's on mute. So... Sorry about that. Um, yes, we can point to it. Alhamdulillah, just as Abdul Qadir al-Jalani stated earlier when he quoted the hadith, which you also mentioned, where the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam approved the belief of the girl when he asked her, where is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And she pointed to the heavens. Okay, can you point where is Allah right now? Yes, we can. Yeah, can you do, you do it, it with yeah. your fingers? Yeah, we it. point up. There we go. Okay, so Allah is up. Okay, uh, Allah. You asked about the throne. Yes, it is. Okay, is the throne <laughs> below Allah? No. When did I say that? You just <laughs> Allah's above the throne. Is the throne below Allah? No. Where did I say that? This, uh, oh. I think I think he misheard him or misspoke because he goes on to agree that the throne is below Allah. So I think he just uh, maybe he was thinking oh. about something and misspoke there. But the throne I'm is asking not. Asking you. No, the throne is not. I mean, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above the throne. This is what I said. Is the throne below Allah? <laughs> yes. Okay. The throne is below Allah. I just said that, yeah. Okay. Uh, is the lowest heaven below the throne? Is the lowest heaven below the throne? Yes, it is. You're asking me hard okay. questions. So do you affirm that Allah, per the hadith, descends every night? To the lowest heaven? Yes, I affirm Nuzul because it's mentioned in the hadith of the Prophet. Okay, so then do you affirm that Allah descends from above the throne to below the throne? He never leaves the throne. But okay. Now notice guys, this is this is already this is already interesting, right? So <laughs> Allah is above the throne, the throne is below Allah, but Allah descends to the lowest heaven, which is below the throne. But he never leaves the throne, right? So this is notice. This is this is interesting, but <laughs> and it's funny because Khalil's just asking him questions, right? I mean, simple, basic questions like, "Hey, based on this hadith, you believe that Allah descends and so on." And so you know, here's the heavens and then the throne, and Allah's over the throne. So just break down for me how this works. He's asking like very simple questions. Okay, if Allah's above the throne, is the throne below Allah? Okay, if if that's above the heaven, then is is the, are the heavens below that? Okay, when Allah descends, goes down to the heavens, so he goes off the, no, 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 he's on the, he stays on the throne. So wait, he's staying on the throne and yet he's descending. And so, uh, you know, real quickly, when it's possible, obviously, for somebody not to hear or understand what somebody's asking or saying, but when, mm -hmm. use, often when somebody is trying to think up uh, uh, what they want to say, right, they're, they're, they're crafting a way to say this because they don't want to just answer it directly and 
accurately, right? That's where all the huh, what, repeat that again comes from. Yeah. I mean, I've seen this. I, I like watching court cases. And one of the things I noticed with certain keen judges is they'll say to the person who's saying, what did, what did you say? You know, you understood me. You heard me. You're just trying to stall so you can think of something in your own mind. But that's that's a tactic mm -hmm. that people do all the time. And uh, anyways, it, it just looks to me like Jake is a little uncomfortable here with this line of questioning. Yeah. And it's uh, it's exactly the sort of things that the Dawa guys like to do to Christians, right? Like ask them these 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 uh, these questions about their theology. But notice he's being asked very simple questions here. OK, if Allah's above them, is he, you know, mm -hmm. is that below and stuff like this? Very simple questions to describe, you know, Allah, wh what is it? What does it mean for Allah to uh, to descend? <laughs> Parthenon says flying carpet thrones. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's going around on his flying carpet throne, and that's how he's descending. Um, yeah, and so let's see. And and by the way, I just wanted to say, um, uh, yeah, Jake sounds kind of dopey here, but he sounded very very intelligent and knowledgeable throughout the discussion. I mean, his opening statement, he really seemed like he knew what he was talking about, and seemed like he was going to school Khalil or at least put up. Uh, one heck of a uh, one heck of a debate, but yeah, it's once you got to the once once the cross examination started and Jake just fell apart with with pretty simple questions based on the other things mm -hmm. that he'd said. But let's go ahead and see uh, where Khalil goes with this. That he discerns, yes, it's a real descent of Nuzul, which is mentioned in the text. Well, let me go back there. Okay, what real descent. Allah descends from above the throne to below the throne. He never leaves the throne. Blind card. I okay, believe that he descends. Yes, it's a real descent of Nuzul, which is mentioned in the text. Okay, what's the meaning of a descent here? Because descent means to go from above to below. So what does Nuzul mean? Yes, we understand it in the plain meaning, which is mentioned in the Hadith. If I had it in front of me, I can read it. But it's very clear. I think everybody knows what descent means. This is the this is the problem. This is where Khalil actually corners him on this. Hey, I think we all know what descent means. I don't need to explain what it means to descend from one spot to another spot. I don't need to explain this. But then he can't he can't he can't understand what this leads That's to. But let's go. Such, ahead and let it... such a cop out. Everybody knows what it means. I don't have to everyone explain. knows what descend means. Yeah, but <laughs> the, what we all think it means it creates a problem here. But we'll check it out. Yeah. So you affirm that Allah descends from above the throne to the lowest heaven below the throne. Without entering his creation, yes. <laughs> Without, so the heavens are created. The heavens are created. He descends, and we all understand what it means to descend. The throne he is created. He descends, in, he, he descends to the lowest heaven but somehow without entering his creation. He's there. He descended. He moved from here into the lowest heaven. So notice he went through all the heavens to get to the lowest heaven, but somehow he's not in creation, even though he's in the lowest heaven, which is definitely created, but he didn't enter into creation. So watch what happens. But he does move then from above the throne to below the throne. Uh, did I mention anything about movement? Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> did I say anything about movement? I said he descends yeah. in a way that we all understand. We all understand what descend means. It needs to go from here above to down below. He goes from up here, which is up here, and he goes down to the lowest heaven. When did I say he moved at all? <laughs> this is awesome stuff. This is awesome stuff. Well, you said everybody knows about movement. Okay, what is the meaning of descend that everybody knows? <laughs> Look at this. <laughs> 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 I, think we all, I think we all know what descends mean. Yeah, it means going from one place to another place, a.k.a. moving. You said that's what it means. It means what we all mean. But then I said, you're saying he moves, and you say, no, I didn't say he moves. Okay, let's just go. <laughs> I just explained it to you. So no, you can't explain again. I'm done. Explain Unfortunately, again. that's... I love Khalil here. Uh, I already explained it to you. Now explain it to me again. I'm done because uh, you didn't explain it. By, by the way, I know what the word descend means, but I couldn't help but look it up real quick just because I was curious if it would use the word move. Uh -huh. <laughs> and it literally, the first uh, answer that comes up, the Oxford Dictionary says move or fall downward. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. We all know what the word means. <laughs> Where did I say move? <laughs> I'm, we all know what descend means. Really yeah, like, yeah, let him uh, answer the question. You Bye. can have... 20 seconds, uh, Jake, if you'd like. Explain it again. What's the meaning of Nuzul that everybody knows? Yeah, so I, I explained it, and Ibn Taymiyyah, which you said that I couldn't appeal to, which I don't know why. All I told you was I don't agree with him on every single position, and that's certainly fine. 
But when it comes to the usul, I agree with him. And the fact of the matter is, he explains this. He talks even about the spirit coming down and the angels and this type of so-called movement, which we cannot really understand. And he compares that to the nuzul or descent of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he says the difference in that is exponentially greater. Therefore, we cannot understand the kafiyah. We don't have enough knowledge on it. We stick to the text and what it says, and we don't dwell on the kafiyah. This is so okay, thank you. Because this is this is the ultimate epic burn. And so it's yes, Allah descends. We don't understand it. We don't understand it. Yes, he somehow goes from this to that, but we we, we can't describe it as movement. We don't understand it. We don't understand it. And watch watch Khalil's watch Khalil's response. We stick to the text and what it says, and we don't dwell on the kafiyah. Okay, right. thank you. Just like we can't understand the kafiyah of Trinity. Thank you very much. So I gave <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't that awesome? <laughs> I mean, he burned him up, right? Like, hey, Jake, you're saying, hey, this is the way it says. We don't understand it. We don't have to understand it. We shouldn't even try to understand it. We just, this is what it says. That's all that. It, that's all there is. But then he turns to Christians, and if if a Christian were to say, hey, you know, God's a Trinity, but I don't understand it. No, you can't do that. You have to explain it. You have to explain, explain wow. it all to me. He just burned them up right there. That was a burn. That was a burn. Yeah. So now we have this uh, this grading here. Let me let me. Uh... <laughs> yeah. uh, by the way, just so that people know, when he uses the term kefia, he, he's referring to uh, the the expression bilachayf, which is mm-hmm. a way of saying without asking yeah. how. And this is supposedly, in terms of the sources, this is supposedly based on text like forty two eleven and one twelve four which I've just talked about, has nothing to do with this kind of metaphysical or philosophical principle. It's mm-hmm. simply saying Allah doesn't have a counterpart, mm-hmm. right? So he can't have offspring, and he doesn't have you know the means to ejaculate and have a child, right? Not because he's not solid, but because he is solid, right? Mm-hmm. And so uh, the whole that whole thing is developed much later than Muhammad, and I don't think it's consistent with what Muhammad was saying. He didn't say that you can't say how. Right. He, but that's that's their their typical mm-hmm. out for this sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Now, with that said, I mean, there's something to be said for that position as far as if God explains to you something about his nature and what he does. And you say, OK, that's way beyond me. I don't I don't get it. And so on. Uh, that's that should be pretty common in theology. You should try to understand mm-hmm. as much as you can, but understand that you're not going to understand everything. But they they won't let any other group besides well, them do this. But it's also this, too, that we usually say something like it's one thing for us to not know how two things go together or something like that. It's another thing to say we're embracing contradictions in the name of our ignorance or something like yeah. that. Mm-hmm. Right now, if somebody could prove genuine contradictions. That's a problem for us as Christians. We can't just say bilah or something like that. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, that's what that's what they want to do, though. They want to say Allah descends, but he doesn't go lower. He doesn't move. Right. <laughs> they want to say these mm-hmm. these terms are being used literally. And then when you press them on that, then it's not literal. And, and by the way, Muslims, not just Salafi Muslims, but uh, even your typical garden variety Ashari, like uh, think of um Hamza Yusuf, right? Very famous Muslim. He has a book called The Creed of Imam Al-Tahawi. So he's passing on and explaining a, a creed of a particular Muslim. In that book, he says that true theology, Islamic theology, involves squaring a circle. Right? That's, that's how he describes it. So you're, you're bringing together two things that are fundamentally contradictory. When we, when we want to present something as contradictory, how do we illustrate it? except by talking about it as a squared circle, right? That's the fun, mm-hmm. that's like the, the classic example of a contradiction. And here's Hamza Yusuf saying that's Islamic theology. Mm-hmm. We, we try and reconcile the idea that something is both a square and a circle. But when Christians say that we don't understand the Trinity, let's say we're not claiming that there's anything irrational here. We think that it is rational. Yeah, we we're can saying explain you can't, it. We can't get your mind around it. Like I can't get my mind around quantum mechanics or relativity yeah. or something like that. Yeah. Now, somebody may want to argue, no, you, it really is contradictory. That's mm-hmm. different, though. You know, you're mm-hmm. not really, you know, at that point, you've got to prove that. But that's not mm-hmm. what we're embracing. This is what Muslims are embracing. They are embracing fundamental absurdity. Yeah. Um, and so, yes, mm-hmm. Allah descends, but doesn't move. Uh, the 
Allah's speech is neither Allah nor other than Allah, all these kinds of things. And when you say, hey, it seems like you're contradicting yourself, it's, uh, yeah, we, we, we accept this without, uh, without asking how. But let's go ahead and see this uh, report card here. So, uh, <laughs> so this is Khalil's conclusion. Uh, he burned him up multiple times in the cross-examination and then in his conclusion. But then, since he's a professor, he actually uh, grades Jake. Arguments. And you're calling it a machine gun approach because you are utterly unprepared for what I had to show you today. You have not actually gone through the primary sources of your own creed or my creed and actually seen the different type of discourse that's there. This is the problem. I'm actually astonished why Jake who frankly is a very, very smart guy, okay? Like, I have to hand it to you. You are yeah. very good at philosophy. You're a very clear thinker. I enjoy, you know, watching some of your other videos. I really do. Uh, you're very smart, and it's just beyond me why you picked the Athari Creed. Because it has, like, the least defensible positions. So, Ouch. <laughs> I, like, frankly, um, I've offered these 10 arguments against the Athari Creed, uh, and you, did, you didn't really respond. So I, I'm going to grade you, okay? I'm a professor, and I grade people, okay? So uh, let's grade your response. So philosophical Kalami arguments are forbidden for Atharis. This is a historical fact. You appeal to Ibn Taymiyyah. Um, I'll give you a D minus on that, okay? Because for this debate, you said you follow the creed of Ibn Kudama, and Ibn Kudama, as well as the followers of Ibn Kudama today, they say philosophy, logic, this is not allowed in the madhab. So you had to go outside the Athari creed. So I'll give you a D minus. Um, number two, anthropomorphism of Ahmed ibn Hanbal. You had nothing to say about that. So I take it you can see you can see the point. You get an F. Um, the problem of tafweed, you had nothing to say about tafweed. In fact, you change your view. You said you commit to tafweed via Facebook message, but today you said you commit to the apparent meaning, which is worse than tafweed. So you get an F. <laughs> okay, and same for all the other tough weed. Now, you did appeal to mystery, so you fall into argument five. You said, we don't know how God descends. It's Real incomprehensible, life. but we believe it. Well, congratulations, you've appealed to mystery, and uh, you are no different from the Trinitarian Christians that you like to debate. So for any Trinitarian Christian watching this, remember what Jake has said today. He said, God is above his throne, and he descends in some incomprehensible way, and we don't know how. OK, so now every Christian can say God is three persons, one essence, and we don't know how the actual positive arguments you offer. I gave you had like nothing to say about these arguments. So I'm giving you F's on most of them. You did try to answer number eight. I'll give you a D minus for trying. I like giving participation marks as well. But really, everything was an F. <laughs> he says but really everything was an F. <laughs> so he gave him a couple of D. He gave him a couple of D minuses. He gave him a couple yeah. of D minuses, but he said, but really everything is an F. So, uh, <laughs> so yeah, uh, matter of fact, I'll go in, uh, after we're done, I'll add that, um, as a link in the description box where people want to check that out. But yeah, uh, again, uh, even though he, I mean, by the end he was crushing Jake, Jake did do a lot of research, a lot of studying, um, was, was bringing up points that sounded like he was, he was making uh, good points and so on, but it all came crumbling to the ground by the end. And so, uh, yeah, that was, uh, that was pretty much a massacre by the end. Um, all right. Well, I think we are, uh, done. We will have to, yeah, we'll, we'll go, we'll go into a bit more detail on Allah's body parts in some future show where, we're, where we'll actually pull up all the, we'll pull up the sources on the screen and stuff like that. So, so people can check them out. We have Scarlet here. If castration was common knowledge, in Muhammad's day, why didn't anyone call this prophet out when he said sperm originates in the chest cavity? Well, you can't, I mean, you can't, you can't chop off people's chest cavity. I mean, you can, but then you kill them. So that's not going to work on your slaves and so on. Um, but yeah, uh, you, you may be overestimating how able people were to call out Muhammad's nonsense. Yes. Wasn't the safest, wasn't the safest thing to do. All right, guys, any final thoughts before we, uh, shut it down? I would say the big takeaway here is that Islam is a joke. And... Mm -hmm. well, that's pretty rude. Oh, yeah. What are you talking about? Yeah. Is that what we've been saying? No, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, it's crazy. Uh, so hang on. So, uh, good client here said, uh, 
said, uh, I'm dying laughing on the grading part, lol. Yeah, the grading part was hilarious. But um, uh, what was interesting there was uh, like you had it, you, you had the topic of the debate. It was um, Athari Creed versus Islamic uh, philosophy or something like that. But uh, Islamic philosophy is not Islamic philosophy in general. It's a it's a it's a, you know, a, a specific view. And then uh, Jake kept attacking Khalil's personal views and not the position. And then uh, Khalil would point out, hey, I, I'm debating this. T this is the topic. And uh, Jake just kept whining over and over again. Whoa, why can't I respond to your view? He's like, because this is the topic. This is the topic right here. He kept whining. Um, anyway. All right, ladies and gentlemen. So uh, we've seen we've seen we watched these guys go on a podcast and downplay their disagreements. And then. We went through, we went through one actual major disagreement. They have lots more when it comes to Allah's attributes and so on. Um, but you see, they have really, really, really big theological disagreements and they are constantly, you know, tack fearing each other and so on. Ah, you're an unbeliever now. You're an unbeliever now. You're an apostate. You're an apostate. You're a heretic. You're a ter You're a heretic, uh, constantly. And then what's interesting is when, Jake tries to, someone like Jake, who is a debater, who is intelligent, who studies these things, who wants everyone to have correct theology, actually tries to defend his position. He gets stuck on things like, okay, if Allah's above the throne, is the throne below Allah? And okay, if he moves down here, did he, did he, if he goes from here to here, did he move and things like that? And so Never thought about that, huh? they just tend to hold everyone else to a different standard. And you see what happens when they're pressed on their theology. The takeaway message here is learn some of their theology so that you can ask those kinds of basic questions to them and see, see what they're going to do, see what they're going to say. Because keep in mind, you're talking about Jake. He's the metaphysician. He's the expert on this. And he was stumped by basic, simple questions about, okay, if Allah descends, did he move? Nope. Wait, what? Uh, we, it's incomprehensible, incomprehensible, incomprehensible. Do you accept incomprehensible as an answer from anywhere else? No, only us. We're the only ones who can have an incomprehensible theology. Interesting stuff. It's it's very uh, interesting. Um, that whole hadith of Allah descending um, in, a, in a part of the... So the, the whole hadith goes something like that, uh, that every night... Um, at a specific specific time of the night, Allah descends to the lowest heaven, where He then uh, stays for a while to uh, say, "Where are my servants? Where are the the Muslims? You know, uh, to answer their prayers and to to answer their you know the concerns and whatever it is." And and then He leaves, then He goes away. Like my main concern when I think of that hadith and when I talk about it is usually that it altogether doesn't make any sense if you if you look at uh, how the world actually looks with a modern view, because at what time exactly would he descend? At what time would he would he descend and not be there at the same time uh, anywhere, everywhere else? It, it, I mean, considering that there is no such thing as a night from outside, because it is always day somewhere and always night somewhere else, he would have to be at the lowest heaven forever, permanently, and never go away. It just does not make sense. A AP, make sense. which part of without asking how <laughs> didn't you understand? He was perfectly clear on that. Stop trying to understand it. Stop asking how. I am as, sorry. As, as long as you do that, you're good to go. <laughs> Mystery solved. <laughs> uh, I, I'm imagining every uh, bank robber on trial right now saying, I got this money and it's not appropriate to ask how. We don't imagine. Imagine if we could ask use how. this in other. You can areas. do a video on that. Great, you can do a video it? on it. <laughs> Anthony, you can do you can do a skit on that. You could show a you could show a clip of one of the Muslims going and, and without asking how, without asking how, be look high, right? And then you look at it and you go, you get an idea, and you go rob, you go <laughs> you go steal a car. Hey, how'd you get this? Hey, without asking how, officer. <laughs> uh, if it's good enough for Allah, it's good enough for me. All right, ladies and gentlemen, well, we've gone through several uh, sections of that discussion from a couple days ago, and uh, yeah, we are uncovering lots of interesting little bits of deception here. What else do we expect from our heroes in the Dawagandis community? It just seems to be 14 centuries of trying to deceive people in the name of Allah. And guess what? 
th think about this, ladies and gentlemen. We catch these guys over and over and over again lying. Perfect preservation right down to the letter. We spend decades exposing it, and then they finally admit, yeah, it was all a lie. Uh, scientific miracles. They spend We spend decades debunking it finally. Okay, we admit it's been debunked. It's all, it was all a lie. Um, they deny that there are death penalties for apostasy and things like that, child marriage. They deny all this. We're liars and so on. Then they admit, okay, it was all, it was all a lie. So the Dawa community, I'm keeping my, I'm not talking about your average Muslim An average Muslim might be you, some Muslim that, you know, might be the most honest person in the world. Talk about the Dawa guys, biggest bunch of liars we've ever seen anywhere in our lives. <clears throat> Do you think this all just started now? Do you think these Dawa guys just got the idea now that they can lie all they want? Or... Has this always been a part of Islam? Does this go back? Does this go back to when they're forging hadiths that you could just, it's okay. It's okay to make things up to, for, for, for our religion. Yes, it does. And so you got a big problem here. Deception is built into it. It's always been a part of it. And they expect us to take all this stuff seriously when other representatives are liars and are quoting sources that were written by liars and telling us that this is the truth. Weird stuff. Very rude. Very, very rude. Very rude. Uh, right, we will be back sometime. Uh, wait, be sure. Wait, David. No. Wait, David. I want to. I want to uh, briefly end with a little story, if you want. Well, I just wanted to tell everyone before we cut out. Uh, Anthony's uh, YouTube channel is in the description box if you want to check out uh, some of his uh, topics uh, that he discusses in his videos. Link is in the description box to his channel. Now, what do you want to say, AP? I want to say just to point out uh, all of the. The major differences, the major uh, disagreements, the major disunity within uh, Islamic theology. When I was a Muslim and I grew up in a in a uh, rather uh, Sufi, mysticist, uh, spiritualist, uh, Sunni household, uh, we believed in pretty much any regular Sunni position, but it was actually not allowed for me to say uh, to to do to to say Allah is above. Or Allah is up there, or Allah is uh, in the heaven. It, it was for me not allowed. Later, I understood why. It was that um, in our Sufi tradition, it was established that uh, it is incorrect to say Allah is above or Allah is up there, and we are supposed to understand that entirely, um, you know, metaphorically uh, when it says that He goes, uh, He rises, and He goes above the throne. So when the Salafis say uh, point to the sky and say uh, Allah is above. And even when uh, many of the regular Sunni Muslims do the very same thing, we would say that is not true. That is their belief and it is an incorrect belief. Our belief is actually true and our belief is that Allah is only, um, Allah is in status above. He, he rose above, but he is actually everywhere. And by everywhere, I mean, yes, really everywhere. Like he's, he's omnipresent. He's everywhere at the same time. Uh, he's, he's very close to you, not only uh, in, in whatever metaphorical understanding you mean, he is actually close to you, by you, and in every position, in every place that you can possibly imagine at the same time. So um, that was the understanding. And that's also a very common understanding uh, throughout Islam and even even within that view, there is a difference of uh, is Allah actually everywhere or is Allah uh, only everywhere in a sense, in a different sense? And that there is a, there is a fight over uh, that as well. So even even with that part, there is just there is there is no way of coming together and finding common ground. And that is supposed to be a very fundamental uh, aspect of of how Allah exists and what Allah actually is. And so it's good that you've escaped all that confusion and are now surrounded by good Christian friends. Catch y'all next time.